Hello, everyone. Thank you and welcome to the tutorial for fairness in healthcare uh, in machine learning. Uh, I would request uh, Muhammad to please start the slides. A few logistics and housekeeping things, uh, just with a quick show of hands or some sort of a confirmation that you can hear me all right. Great, thank you, thank you, awesome. Uh, so very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Ankur Tere Desai. Uh, I am the Chief Technology Officer for Kensai, a company that I founded out of the University of Washington, Tacoma, uh, four and a half years ago. I'm also a professor at the University of Washington, been working in healthcare and machine learning for over a decade. And it's great to see many friends in the audience, uh, along with my colleagues who have worked in these topics for several years uh, and presented some amazing work at KDD itself. Uh, Today, uh, I have with me uh, Mohammed uh, Ahmed, Dr. Carly Eckert, Christine Ellen, Juva, Vikas, Dr. Arpit Patel, uh, and myself. Uh, we've all uh, worked together to create uh, this tutorial. And I would like quickly uh, to uh, have each person who's on the call from, from our team to introduce themselves. So Mohammed, you next. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Mohammed Ahmed. Um, so I, I also work uh, at uh, Kensai in the capacity of the principal data scientist and also affiliated with the Department of Computer Science at uh, UW Tacoma. Uh, Dr. Carly? Sure, hi everyone. My name is Carly Eckert. I'm a physician um, and clinician. I work um, as the head of clinical informatics at Kensai um, with Dr. Ankur and Mohammed. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Dr. Carly. Not sure if Christine or Rikas or anybody else is on. They will join us in due time. Great. Uh, so with that, I wanted to uh, launch into it uh, directly. Uh, and so, Mohammed, maybe we can... So, oh yeah, a few housekeeping things. Chat, uh, please post questions, comments, um, you know, views and opinions as freely as you would like. Uh, the tutorial is about three hours of content, uh, leaving a lot of room for discussion. This is by no means an easy topic to digest. Uh, it, it's you know quite complex for us, but at the same time, we have tried to put the material and make it as much accessible as we can. There's a lot of overview on the depth of uh, several issues of fairness in machine learning that are not necessarily just applicable to healthcare, but we have tried to, in our experiences, and as we deploy solutions or as we work on different data sets and problems and use cases in healthcare, try to bring all that shared knowledge back into this tutorial. So it would become much more meaningful for us uh, if you would also participate and, uh, uh, and, and try to you know, pitch in with your viewpoints. Uh, disagreements are always welcome uh, and it's great to have a dialogue. So we are hoping that uh, you know, everyone feels comfortable in sharing their views and no question is, uh, is unwelcome from that perspective. Please feel free to stop us and uh, you know, engage in a conversation, we certainly do that. Uh, my job will be to uh, present the overview in the beginning, and I will help moderate uh, as well uh, with questions uh, as they come in. So please feel free to reach out. Um, one second, I'm going to... Uh, options. Um, screen. 
So next slide. So today we are going to cover a, a lot of topics, but I want to start with uh, discussing about foundations of fairness in healthcare machine learning. How did we arrive here? How did we get here? Uh, what were some of the inequities in healthcare that led us to start putting this material together and discuss with you the importance of uh, fairness? Then we will go in depth on different ways to measure and the chances of mismeasurement of fairness in healthcare. Uh, we'll talk about uh, use cases. So um, Muhammad and Dr. Carly will go hand in hand, taking each uh, idea of measurement uh, and, and how to measure fairness, and then show us how that applies in the healthcare setting. So it's going to be a very fascinating and interesting back and forth uh, between them as they go through one concept and then talk about it from the healthcare perspective. Uh, then we will go into operationalizing fairness in machine learning because, you know, theoretically talking about fairness is one thing while actually putting it in a pipeline and trying to make hundreds of models score uh, with fairness in mind is a hugely different challenge. And, and we'll shine some light on that aspect of operationalization. Uh, then we'll specifically talk about the domain challenges for healthcare machine learning. So healthcare, as you know, is highly regulated, uh, different coding systems, uh, different data representation systems. In fact, different practices across the world make just the domain of healthcare full of many nuances that are very unique to, uh, to healthcare and nowhere else. Uh, so we'll try to bring in some of that into this as well and how it pertains to uh, fairness and, and, and unbiased um, uh, approaches to machine learning. Uh, with that, we'll go into a few examples of uh, fair healthcare ML in action. Uh, we'll talk about best practices. And then uh, we have a very exciting section where we are uh, launching for the first time a library of uh, fair ML algorithms uh, that we have designed and developed for everyone's benefit. It's an open source library that you should be able to use. Uh, and uh, you know, Vikas and Christine will do a demo of that library uh, towards the end and go through the notebooks and show you how to use that. Uh, after that, we'll come back uh, for a small conclusion. Uh, you know, any meta Q&A, uh, any learnings that the audience might have uh, to share, uh, and we'll, we'll close with that uh, roughly around uh, five o'clock. So, uh, so four hours of togetherness, uh, trying to make sure that we understand this topic deeply uh, and, and we are at your service to make sure that it's a conductive, conducive conversation. Next slide, please, Mohammed. Yeah. So a quick audience poll uh, by a show of hands, just to get everyone riled up and excited. Uh, how many, uh, are there any physicians or MDs in the room? None? Okay, how many of you work in the healthcare domain? Thumbs up is a good way to... Uh... Great. Uh, how many have built a machine learning model? Assuming everyone here has built a machine learning model or maybe just getting started on the journey. Great, thank you. Uh, how many of you have worked on actual healthcare data? I'm not talking about just electronic medical record data or claims data. It could be variables data. It could be uh, you know data from any other sources. Nice, a few of you. That's great. A show of hands is awesome. Uh, how many of you are enthusiasts here, and this is your first time uh, attending a tutorial or being part of an audience where we are discussing healthcare machine learning or machine learning applied to healthcare? 
great to see some newcomers too. Welcome. This is a very exciting community and we hope that you will like what you see today and throughout KDD because there's a lot of uh, healthcare related uh, papers and, and activities happening. Uh, so I do want to remind everyone uh, that like the tutorial today, tomorrow morning, starting nine o'clock, uh, everyone who has registered for KDD also has the benefit of attending the health day at KDD, which is uh, a whole day uh, full of uh, healthcare machine learning uh, papers this year. We have specifically focused on COVID-19. So AI for COVID is the theme. Uh, and if you enjoy this tutorial, please do come to Health Day uh, tomorrow. Uh, and, and there are some fantastic panels from NSF, from the healthcare uh, industry, uh, actual leaders from um, you know, healthcare systems across the US are going to present how they are using AI to battle COVID uh, and that's tomorrow. So, so I'll remind it again, uh, like remind everyone again towards the end of the uh, tutorial um, about health day. And that's tomorrow. Uh, so great. Mohammed, next slide, please. Thank you. So today, as we all know, we are facing unprecedented times. We were not prepared for the viral pandemic such as COVID-19 and its implications are being felt around the world. Inequity in healthcare has been an epidemic in our society for the last thousands of years, ever since healthcare was institutionalized as a discipline, right? Uh, and in a similar way, uh, just like we were not prepared for a pandemic like COVID-19, I feel that we are not prepared for handling the responsibility that is placed on our, uh, our, our heads uh, with the rapid advances in AI and its use, not just in healthcare, but across multiple domains. Um, so this is both an opportunity as well as a ca cause for concern. And we see the need jointly in developing a responsible AI framework, not just for healthcare, but for everything. Specifically for healthcare, uh, we, would, we think about responsible AI to be broken down across four main uh, pivots. Explainability and transparency is just the you know, table stakes for implementing machine learning models in healthcare. Uh, today, we will focus most of our time and, time and energy in discussing how fairness and unbiased machine learning uh, frameworks can be developed. In the future, we would like to talk about robustness and privacy and security. Uh, next slide, please. If you think about uh, you know, uh, this journey that we have been on, I personally am very fortunate to have been able to lead this team from Kensai and the University of Washington Tacoma, working on making elements of AI more ethical over the last few years together. Uh, in fact, uh, KDD is our home for disseminating many of these advances. Uh, in 2018 in London, we conducted our first tutorial on the topic of explainability in healthcare machine learning. Our focus at that time uh, was to shine the light on need for open interpretable models in healthcare. Uh, today, there are many, many new works uh, and amazing tutorials, in fact, we attended just one in the morning uh, talking about interpretable and open uh, ML in healthcare. So the field has certainly advanced a lot in that, in that space. Even deep learning models uh, and explainability and interpretability of deep learning methods is quite a popular topic nowadays. Uh, over the last two years, we as a team have been working on iterations to the ethics in AI problem. And today we are proud to announce the launch of this tutorial on fairness and unbiased ML in healthcare. Uh, in the coming years, we are hoping to intend uh, to continue the work by bringing in elements of robustness and secure and, and private machine learning for healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, diving right into it, fairness in machine learning in general uh, can be thought of as applying to all sorts of machine learning techniques from classification to causal inference all the way. Yet, 
more than 90% of the literature in fairness in machine learning uh, is in the classification setting. So uh, if you click that, you will notice that most of the work today remains confined. And the reason for that is 95%, as Andrew Nug likes to say, 95% of machine learning applications in the world today are classification-based supervised learning techniques. So hence, the attention on making sure that that, that component of fairness in ML uh, is taken care of is our first priority. But that also has that also opens up a lot of questions around can fairness in ml be made general enough to apply to all the other ml techniques at the same time uh, and while today we may not be able to talk too much about it uh, i am putting this out as a call to action for everyone to think about which of these solutions and um, tricks that we are going to talk about in the tutorial today might actually be applicable to other machine learning models as well. Uh, so next slide, please. But before we, we go into machine learning for healthcare or fairness in healthcare, let's first get a working definition of healthcare itself, right? Uh, because I don't think two people agree on what is, uh, what is healthcare, right? Uh, if you ask uh, a, a, a trauma surgeon like Dr. Carly, she will have a, a different viewpoint of healthcare as a continuum and someone working in social work, treating diabetic patients may have a completely different vision and version. So we often think of healthcare as care needed when the human body goes crazy, right? Many of us think of this uh, like fixing the engine or the transmission when a car is broken. We often don't think of healthcare as being on a spectrum, on a continuum from early detection to proactive prevention, the term wellness often reflects the goal of AI-driven decision-making across the continuum of care. And when, and when we say healthcare, that's really what we are trying to uh, project. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, within that continuum of care, this is one view of healthcare AI, the x-axis, is the time uh, and, and the y-axis is the amount of automation or as I like to call it, assistive intelligence uh, that we need to get to. Uh, now, if you notice, uh, today we live in a world of rule-based systems as shown in gray. So if you walk into a major hospital uh, or a health system in the United States, you will see a lot of risk calculators. You will see physicians using checklists which are essentially derived from uh, years of study of clinical prediction rules uh, and large funded studies where patients are observed over a long period of time, protocols are decided, and then these protocols are institutionalized into some sort of checklist or some sort of a rule-based system. Now, increasingly in the coming decade, we are already noticing the use of machine learning in systems for uh, diagnostic decision support. Uh, in, in another two decades or even sooner, we will see autonomous ventilators and AI-driven insulin pumps uh, that will be clinically approved. The area of proactive intervention, in some sense, will subsume the inefficiencies of reactive guidance in healthcare. And that's where the importance of responsible AI and fairness really starts to shine. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we will start uh, noticing, uh, Mark, thank you. Uh, so, so, you know, I have been fortunate over the last decade to have worked closely with numerous health systems across the world and realize that every stage of the continuum of care from birth to death and everything in between has a corresponding objective function for machine learning. In fact, every prediction, every prediction problem in healthcare has multiple objective functions, depending on who the user is or who the end consumer of the model output is, be it a clinician prescribing the labs, be it a nurse practitioner raising an alarm of code blue, uh, or a social worker helping, as I said earlier, a diabetic patient uh, get screened regularly uh, to patient themselves who may be nudged differently by their Fitbits and their Apple Watches, uh, depending on 
uh, when they last went for a run or took a brisk walk, etc. AI in general will integrate and interfere with the practice of medicine, no matter what. So now we must be very careful in how we create solutions for healthcare using AI. Next slide, Mohan. So I want us to read this quote. The importance of this, uh, as Dr. Martin Luther King pointed out almost 54, year, 54 years ago, that he said to quote, of all forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhuman. It is, you know, not trivial anymore, uh, as we have seen uh, the, the events in recent times and the back Black Lives Matter movement. We have come to notice that more and more and more of this inequity is starting to surface. And particularly, it is now the responsibility of data scientists and AI practitioners to ensure that we pay attention to this important topic. And the only way we can do so is by ensuring that uh, the, the, the techniques as well as the solutions that we design for models in healthcare are fair and unbiased from that perspective. Uh, and that forms the motivation of most of our work here today. Next slide, Mohammed. So, sorry, yeah, thank you. So imagine an emergency room on a Monday morning in a large US downtown, um, US city downtown. Among other patients with severe wounds and trauma, waiting to be seen by an attending physician uh, there are three patients with mild chest pain also waiting over there. Uh, now imagine the triage nurse uh, is using your AI model to help her bring to attention the most severe of the patients. Uh, it has been shown in, in numerous studies that rule-based systems that don't use machine learning have a very low precision for or predicting or handling such problems. So the hospital is now using a more precise machine learning algorithm to help streamline the flow and improve outcomes. After using the system for a few months, there seems to be a problem. The model always fails to correctly risk stratify the severity of illness for a specific race and gender when trying to select who to prioritize, right? And this is, this is in spite of having recent data on which model, on, on which the model was trained. This is in, in spite of putting the model into production and, and testing, right? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, or this is in spite of the model, not in production yet, but in sort of a pilot stage, right? The problem is very real. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, a large hospital in the city of Chicago uh, tried to use this exact same model and the model was later real, revised uh, as they realized that chest pain factors that, that they were using from prior studies did not include any black males. Uh, thus, bias, discrimination, and unfair practices in healthcare are not hypothetical. They are very, very real. They are here to stay. And we must do something about it. Next slide, please. By the way, if you could... Uh, uh, mute your mic while you're not speaking. It will be helpful uh, for the recording. Thank you. Uh, so in fact, uh, policymakers across the world are also becoming increasingly aware of the issue of AI adoption uh, and roadblocks uh, and see algorithmic accountability as a very important topic. Uh, while we know uh, that GDPR and EU regulation has made it uh, extremely tough to collect data and manage it. Uh, but even the US Congress has been trying to pass the Algorithmic Accountability Act, which would mandate accountability of algorithmic systems uh, for a few years now. Uh, the relationship of this act with HIPAA and other laws 
that address patient privacy needs uh, will continue to evolve. And in fact, increasingly, all of us will play quite an active role in, in making this type of regulation stand uh, within the US and across many other countries. Next slide, please. So there are uh, several uh, racial and bias statements against uh, black people uh, in pretty much all ancient medical literature, be it Greek, Indian, Arab, or Chinese. Uh, the root of modern bias and discrimination go all the way back to the birth of modern science. So it's not something that is new. Uh, representation of blacks in the medical profession, for example, has been non-existent in the West, which has made the uh, which has made perpetuation of bias much easier or worse. Because when you don't have role models, it creates even more problems in the delivery of healthcare or that particular discipline. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, as you can see on this slide, healthcare is rife with inequity and racial prejudice. So if you had any doubts that uh, fairness in ML or racial prejudice doesn't exist in healthcare. Uh, this slide and several others that I'm about to show will, will lay that issue to rest quite, quite you know, uh, quickly. Uh, three examples are presented here. Uh, the Tuskegee study is actually deplorable. Uh, sickle cell uh, was, uh, you know, uh, was, was studied for a long time and human bias led to discriminatory action uh, or discriminatory selection of candidates for bypass surgery uh, in, in the sickle cell disease study, right? Uh, and then there are a few other examples of issues in machine learning that we will have to broadly address when we think of fairness in healthcare ML. The main point that I'm driving towards, as you can tell by now, is that designing techniques that address the issue in data uh, are not going to be enough uh, to design fair and trustworthy AI systems in healthcare. In fact, uh, and, and it's, next slide, please. In fact, it's, uh, it's not obviously just race. Uh, as we know, gender discrimination has also played a major role in the delivery of healthcare uh, for decades. Uh, according to a 2009 analysis here, uh, US women, so within the United States, women made up just 37% of research subjects, even though you know, they comprise more than half of the US population. So you can start seeing the inequity right there, uh, very clear uh, as cited by this work. Next slide, please. So to stress the point home, we really um, want to make sure that um, medicine is not you know, alone in this, right? Uh, so, so if you go to the uh, next slide, Mohammed. Yeah, uh, computer science, in fact, has played a, played a role in this unfair treatment. Uh, algorithmic discrimination goes all the way back to 1970s in, in CS. Uh, the literature on fairness and bias in machine learning started to appear in the late 90s uh, or late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, it was not until 2010 that it became a prominent subsection of the AI ML community. Uh, and recent articles are starting to shine the light on, on this issue quite prominently. But the role of our community, this community that we are all in uh, at KDD and uh, you know, other conferences will go a long way in shaping these solutions. So here are some references of uh, bias in, in healthcare AI and, and a historical perspective on how AI itself has been uh, not, not very responsible uh, back, back in, in the days since it started and initiated, right? Next slide, please. Uh, in fact, uh, recently, we discovered uh, a, a very interesting study uh, which came out in an article uh, which was, you know, actually ACLU had to intervene where it was revealed that 
uh, in Idaho, uh, which is a state in the Pacific Northwest of United States, uh, members of the Medicaid program in Idaho with cognitive or learning disabilities uh, had their healthcare benefits reduced uh, by, you know, fifty to thirty thousand uh, dollars, based on an AI model uh, that was making decisions on which services to accept a particular patient on, uh, without any uh, explanations, and that led to a lawsuit, uh, and an ACLU uh, help you know, bring that lawsuit forward in, in the court in Idaho. And then it revealed, so through the, through the process of that lawsuit, it, it was discovered that these cost-cutting decisions uh, were unfairly made by an AI model. So just another example of uh, recent work uh, that, has, that, has shine, shine, that has been shining the light on inequities in, uh, in healthcare because of irresponsible AI. Next slide, please, Muhammad. So as we go through the tutorial today, and as we discuss different components of uh, machine learning for, from a fairness in machine learning perspective, the main message that I want to drive home is that it's not just the data set that impacts fairness, but rather, Every element in the machine learning pipeline affects fairness. Example, pre-processing of the data, imputation of the data, the choice of algorithms that we use, uh, the, the inner workings of that algorithm and how it decides uh, which particular uh, kernel or which particular uh, objective function to minimize or maximize in terms of loss functions. And then towards the end of the spectrum, the usage of the output of those machine learning models also has a huge impact on fairness in machine learning. So it's not just a data problem. It's not just a human computer interaction problem. It's the whole pipeline that needs to be reviewed and looked at. And we'll offer some solutions to how to do that systematically today. But I want all of us to be uh, acknowledging first of the problem of fairness in machine learning being more than uh, just an imbalanced data set problem. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of the issues that make it very clear that it is not just a data problem. Uh, in fact, when we talk about generalizability and representation of the models, uh, oftentimes enough consideration is not given to the interpretation of those models in randomized clinical trials. Uh, electronic health records, as we all probably know, many of us in the room have worked with EHRs for a long time are mainly observational databases. Uh, they reflect not the health of the patient, but they reflect in some sense the transactional nature of the interactions of the patient with the health system. So only what is needed in order to capture the state of the disease or the symptom in order to get reimbursed uh, by a, a payer or a, or a, or a you know, uh, tran financial transaction uh, is what gets captured uh, inside the EHR most of the time. In fact, it does not capture when the patient first developed that disease. There is no mandatory requirement in any electronic health record for, for the physician to actually ask the patient, hey, when did you first notice this? And they may ask that question, but they don't have any a regulatory responsibility to actually record that and say, oh, this, this patient has been suffering from this particular disease or related conditions of this disease, you know, for the last two years or for the last six weeks, right? So, so it's a very uh, incomplete representation of the 
status of the health of a patient. And understanding and acknowledging that often helps address that bias in healthcare because as you start getting more and more data, fairness in machine learning techniques can start accounting for uh, those disparities and, um, sh and sort of shortcomings of EHR data sets. Another important aspect is the billing codes that are used in, for example, office visits might be influenced more by the reimbursement policy of the provider and the contract between the provider and the, and the eventual paying entity rather than the original reason for the visit. So, uh, you know, it may be entirely possible that someone went in to get a checkup for, you know, disease A, but the claim that got generated often got decorated with, you know, three other diseases that had nothing to do with that particular visit. But because that's how the contract is structured, that's how you will find the data. Right? Uh, so, so is it just a data problem or is it the broader ecosystem problem? In fact, uh, the practices regarding how data is changed or recorded changes over time, right? So reporting, how a, like reporting, for example, if a patient fell uh, during uh, their uh, nursing facility stay or they fell at home, uh, uh, we have all known about for a few years now this problem of opioids and how overprescribing opioids has increased from 2005 to 2012. Uh, but the rates that differed by practice and patient population across the US. Uh, and there's a very nice paper by McClintock talking about uh, how that opioid disparity happened, right? So again, it's, just, it's not just a data problem, right? Data is just a signal, right? Uh, and as Aginel talks about in the 2018 paper, uh, lab tests are often ordered more, like more lab tests are often uh, prescribed for more sick patients. So does that over-testing uh, really help the patient? Uh, does that over-testing imply it's a confounder for how sick the patient is? We don't know. But uh, does the treatment uh, get given better when someone has tested a patient more often is also uh, something that is not predictable and often causes a lot of uh, data disparity, which leads to machine, which leads to machine learning models becoming uh, either less accurate or at least less robust and less holistic. Right. So here are some of the examples. Next slide, please. So when we think about all these issues and what we have talked about so far, we will quickly start realizing that fairness in machine learning is a systems problem. It is not just an AI problem. Uh, so the choice of data set, the cohorts, the inclusion exclusion criteria, the algorithms that we select, the models that we eventually uh, use and put into production, the type of interventions we design, uh, the interactions that we design from an end user perspective, uh, whether it is a clinician user, it is the patient themselves or the physician, and the context in which that intervention is being provided all become part of the system and fairness in machine learning has to be addressed across all of these uh, in, you know important interjections and points before it can be systematically rooted out uh, or rather unfairness can be rooted out right? uh, next slide please so you know one of the things if we understand that the system itself is full of biases, uh, these are all the different protected classes against which we want to work on to reduce that bias and make sure that uh, fairness is reflected across this. So in order to, uh, you know, so far we have talked about fairness as a very generic thing. We have talked about uh, you know, systems being unfair. We have talked about examples of un unfair uh, inclusion in studies. But over, over a period of time, as, un as the civil society understanding of fairness and bias evolved uh, in society, uh, le the legal profession, as well as the healthcare profession, as well as the technology profession, all three, uh, along with policy, came together to define uh, 
what we call as legal protected classes. And within that context, race under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, color, uh, sex, uh, which was both 1964 law as well as the equal pay rights. And, and you might have heard or seen the movie uh, about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, and, the, and the amazing work that she did in order to br bring um, you know, equal pay across sexes uh, and gender equality played an important role. Uh, religion is a protected attribute uh, and it's not legal to discriminate um, healthcare services uh, on the basis of religion. Uh, in fact, national origin and citizenship status are also protected attributes uh, in, in, the, in the healthcare delivery process. And age is, is of course, something that we all are uh, easy to understand that age-based discrimination uh, in employment is, is not allowed, but also in healthcare is not allowed, right? Uh, so, 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 so long, so, so forth, it goes to show that even familial status, uh, whether you are single, married, divorced, uh, does not or should not ideally play a role in making decisions uh, when it comes to health of an individual. Uh, we are, some of us or everyone here might be familiar with the uh, American Disabilities Act, uh, in 1990, uh, and it is not legal to discriminate uh, based on the disability status of a person, uh, pregnancy, veteran status. And then recently in 2008, or rather almost you know, uh, 12 years ago now, uh, genetic information is also a class of protected attribute. So when we design uh, fair and unbiased AI solutions, the entire team of data scientists, as well as the underlying system, has to have some sort of mechanism uh, to tag each of these types of attributes as protected. Uh, it has to have a way of some sort of uh, metadata labeling in order to ensure that at least across these protective cl protected classes, there is some form of uh, you know, special treatment uh, and, and technological solution that we put in place in order to ensure that when a classifier or when a regression model is trying to score someone, at least based on these attributes, the scoring is fair and generic. Next slide, please. And happy to answer questions on each of these as we go into the, uh, into the presentation. So as we face COVID-19, uh, in fact, this problem of um, unfair healthcare practices and, and particularly data-driven and AI-driven unfair practices has increased or, or has the propensity to increase unless we pay attention to it. Uh, take an example of healthcare rationing where due to the stresses caused by COVID-19 uh, on the national healthcare system globally, uh, you know, will there be some form of discrimination when there are limited resources for uh, acute care settings, right? Uh, what happens when ICU demands exceed uh, the treatment of the, or the number of beds available in ICU treatment facilities? How should uh, physicians and doctors decide between which patients to treat uh, or, or transfer from the general ward to the ICU? who to put on a ventilator. So these are all the questions that are now coming through and there are many public examples of uh, you know, elective surgeries being denied to certain classes, um, ventilators not becoming available for certain age groups because they are too old or they are you know, too young and, and so on. If you go to the next slide, we'll give you a framework of um, Sorry, moment. Yeah, thank you. So if you go to the next, yeah, this, if you see this slide, right, it gives us a framework of how the problem is very complex and intricate, right? Fairness is very stakeholder dependent. So just the way I talked about COVID-19 and the situation of denying care may become uh, an unfair practice. If you think about it, uh, we as data scientists 
often look at the confusion matrix and we think about how we can make the model more accurate. But uh, that's not necessarily the viewpoint from a physician, patient, or a societal perspective. A physician may want the model to be most precise um, without having to worry about any of the protective classes, right? And even though there are inherent biases that may creep in on the treatment plan or the decision that they are making, in general, most physicians try to make a decision objectively uh, without thinking about the race or the gender or the you know, class of the patient. But we all know that it doesn't happen like that, right? So, so an AI-driven assistive intelligence system that is coaching the physician in, in, in that movement to make uh, the clinical decision more effective may actually itself be biased based on the prior behavior of the physician group on which the data was drawn upon, right? Now think of it from a patient perspective. What is the probability that I as a patient will be incorrectly labeled as low risk or high risk uh, depending on my own age, race, gender, ethnicity, etc. right? Uh, if I'm from some protective class or underrepresented class, uh, will I be given the same clinical services uh, according to the best practices and best evidence, right? So these are all the questions that a patient may ask uh, of the AI-driven system uh, and not necessarily the physician may ask, right? So context becomes really important. And at a societal level, uh, from the same confusion matrix, we may actually, as a society, want to optimize for, say, recall, right? In order to make sure that, uh, you know, the AI-driven system actually catches most of the patients that it needs to catch uh, correctly uh, when, we, when we look for an ideal AI system. So there itself, we can start seeing that the physician may focus on accuracy as a measure, the patient may be more interested in uh, you know, a precision given a class that they belong to or a subgroup of classes, and society at large may be interested in recall as the metric. So just highlighting that it's not a very easy problem to solve on which exact measure to focus on, even if we just say classification and accuracy of the model, uh, and we want to make just that part very fair, right? So that's the hairy problem. Next slide, please. So now that you, uh, you know, sort of have seen the different dimensions, uh, here is a nice structure to think about the dimensions of fairness in healthcare AI. Uh, the first framework or the axis on which we like to think is the computational axis. This is where most of the attention of the machine learning community is focused on today. Uh, we talk about um, you know, data bias, model bias, loss function bias, and post hoc optimization of the clinical decision. Uh, and, and these are all computational issues, and we measure the success or the failure of, of a fair AI system uh, across all these four sort of you know, subcategories on the, on the computational axis. But there are two other axes. There is the societal axis, uh, which talks about the structural bias that may have been, been built into the, uh, into the system by society. Uh, and there is the uh, practices uh, bias, which may be, which may be have embedded into the data or the model bias, uh, based on the uh, issues that are prevalent in that particular section of the society, right? And the third axis to think about is the cognitive axis, where as AI systems or AI-driven solutions come into the market and, and get increasingly adopted, uh, more and more we will start seeing that there is an automation bias there is the automation complacency, uh, and there is the bias in delivery. So automation bias, for example, uh, is, uh, you know, just to talk a little bit more about that, would be uh, how decision aids get misused uh, for two main reasons. First one is that when there is an automatically or, or automatically generated queue, uh, these queues are very salient, and they draw the user's attention very nicely. And secondly, uh, the users actually may actually have a tendency to ascribe greater power and authority to an automated aid uh, 
rather than to other sources of advice. Uh, and a good example of this, uh, of automation bias, is really our, uh, you know, our interaction as, you know, just normal users with a, with a GPS, right? Uh, or, or, or a Google map or some sort of a mapping application, right? And, and we, you know, we enter the address, uh, we say, this is where we want to go. And because we have an inherent automation bias, uh, we don't question many times, what is the fastest route or the best route, right? Even though it shows you two or three different choices, uh, that, that bias that it knows best right now is something that we take for granted because iteratively, as that system works again and again and again, uh, we oftentimes come to rely on it so blindly that we accept the bias as something that is latent and inherent in the system, right? And, and so the design of that model uh, has to be aware of introducing bias into that system. And that's the main point that we are trying to uh, highlight, right? So next slide, please. So here are some of the sources uh, by which bias gets introduced in healthcare AI, right? And these have been broken down across uh, three sort of, you know, uh, sections, right? So uh, the data bias is something that we have all talked about. Uh, there is non-data bias. So these are the model bias, loss function bias, and post hoc sort of optimization biases. And then there can be a bias in delivery of the healthcare solution itself. Uh, so the, that's where the cognitive bias and societal bias comes in. So that's your sort of first row where you say, hey, how does bias come into the machine learning cycle itself? And then, you know, now we understand that it comes through three things. The, as you enumerate the different sources of bias, uh, on this slide, you can see uh, the various ways in which each of these starts coming in. So selection or sample bias uh, would be the selection of individuals or groups or data for analysis such that proper randomization is not achieved in the data set. Uh, this ensures that the sample obtained is not representative of the population or may not be generalizable, right? Uh, response bias, for example, uh, is the tendency of the participants who are in that study to respond to tests or assessments based on some factor other than the content of that particular uh, you know, um, study, right? So also there is a consistent difference between those who agree to provide response and those who refuse to provide response. So as the underlying data uh, aggregation system is catching this data, uh, there, is a, there is most of the time, there is a huge response bias to any uh, clinical trial or any, any study done in order to arrive at a particular uh, solution for that, that problem. There could be publication bias, uh, which is, uh, the bias where there is a greater likelihood that studies with positive results, um, at, you know, may have been published more, right? And, and we all know this from the publish or perish paradigm that we live in today, uh, that so many negative results of studies don't often get, get shown or come out in publication. So most of the time we only have a publication bias towards good results, right? Uh, there can be a prejudicial or latent bias. So training data can be often influenced by stereotypes. And we have seen many examples in the slides before on how prejudicial or latent bias led to non-inclusion of certain protected attributes in the study when a, a certain study was done right in the past. So as we conduct studies in the future, which are data driven, we would have to be aware of that prejudicial bias in the system. Uh, another interesting one is the Hawthorne effect, where the uh, alteration of behavior by subjects of a study uh, due to their awareness of being observed, right? So people actually behave differently when they are part of a study, uh, and, and that is captured by this term called the Hawthorne effect. Uh, and it's very hard to know that the machine learning model, so when, when, when we as the ML system or designers of the ML system are actually using the underlying data or the context, we don't know whether the data set has any Hawthorne effect 
where the patients on which that particular treatment or medication was, was applied on, they themselves had changed their behaviors because they were being observed. So again, not a very easy or simple problem to solve, but it's best to sort of highlight these issues and be aware and acknowledge them, right? Uh, next slide, please, Mohammed. And, and in the Q&A, we can go into other types of biases and talk about it. Uh, but I just wanted to give a flavor of some of these that we have observed, we have seen so far in the health system that we work with and the solutions that we are trying to see. Uh, now, let's look at a sort of third and final issue that, that we as data scientists are struggling with today in building models that stand the test of, as I like to call it, fairness, right? Uh, let's, look at, let's look at an example. The data in this plot tells us that children and young adults with different ethnicities, uh, so Hispanic, uh, non-Hispanics, uh, are bound to have different distributions of HbA1c values just within the United States. So obviously, any model that ignores this variation, right, will optimize for the ethnicity that is most prevalent in the underlying data set. So if non-Hispanic whites are, uh, are the most prevalent, then the model will optimize for that, right? Uh, any model that ignores this variation will optimize for the ethnicity uh, uh, that is most prevalent, right? Uh, and the underlying data set on which it was trained. Uh, so not just ethnicity, but you can easily imagine that the model will optimize for uh, prevalence of age, prevalence of gender, uh, even prevalence of social determinants, such as income groups or a zip code uh, that a particular patient may belong to. And these things can often lead to significant variation uh, when you actually deploy the output model into production, right? Because uh, the artificial intelligence process or the ML process uh, is not tuned to estimate and eliminate such biases. Uh, and we cannot produce a bias-free model entirely. There is in fact no, uh, no standard, uh, not even a checklist of how to, uh, how to measure if the produced model is completely bias-free. And uh, later in the, in the tutorial, uh, we will show you that, in fact, there is a very interesting theorem called the theorem of impossibility of fairness. Uh, and I might be getting the phraseology wrong, but it actually talks about how it is, it may actually be impossible to design a completely fair uh, machine learning model, right? So we'll get to that. Next slide, please. So, here is a running example, and, and this will come up again, uh, just like the HbA1c example or the inequity in delivering care in an emergency room that I talked about earlier a uh, few minutes ago. Uh, this is an example we will use uh, of James, a 65-year-old black male, and David, a 65-year-old white male, uh, and both of them having similar symptoms or similar diseases. Uh, of, of a coronary artery disease. And then on one Sunday afternoon, just like today, both, both men experience chest pain. So they go to the emergency uh, along with their, uh, their spouses uh, or partners. And both men are seen by the same ED physician. So we are actually you know, not even introducing any variation in training here. And we are saying that if, if both the uh, males were seen by uh, the same physician, and they are both diagnosed by having um, AMI, uh, which is a heart failure, heart attack. Uh, yet the clinical recommendation and intervention that may be prescribed uh, for James may actually end up being very different than the one prescribed uh, for, for David, right? Uh, and it's entirely possible in our life and times today uh, that uh, James is treated less aggressively compared to David. Uh, and so how do we determine that these two patients are being treated fairly uh, is the question that we ask in this running example. And as we show you some of the data and as we go through the process, uh, 
uh, we will all come to appreciate more and more how these examples are not hypothetical, but very real. We deal with this on an everyday basis. And increasingly, uh, as AI applications get integrated into the healthcare setting, uh, these type of issues uh, will have to be comprehensively surfaced, talked about, and addressed systematically by us as a community uh, in order to solve for these problems. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to hand uh, the baton to Muhammad uh, and do a quick time check as well as see if there are questions on this section before we go on for a break. So Muhammad, over to you. Uh, thank you, Ankur. Uh, so first, a few housekeeping items. Uh, so for this section and for the next uh, several sections, uh, so I will be going over some of the complexity, some major issues related to fairness uh, within the context of healthcare. And I'll be going back and forth with uh, Dr. Carly uh, on this. Uh, if there are questions, especially uh, at the end of the sections, uh, please, please feel free to um, type in your questions in the chat and we would be more than glad to address those questions and have a discussion back and forth regarding uh, topics of relevant interest. Uh, so this section focuses on measurement and uh, mismeasurement of fairness, especially within the context of healthcare. Uh, so let me add the disclaimer that the literature on fairness, uh, it's vast, it's multifaceted as Ankur mentioned. So it's not possible to cover that in the span of hours or even in the span of days. Uh, so that said, uh, we will strategically focus on topics which in our opinion are most relevant and are indispensable to at least give a high level overview or a flavor of fairness within the context of uh, healthcare. So we'll start with uh, talking about different notions of uh, fairness and how these, how they are measured. Uh, so, I'll, so I'll start with the uh, focus on this uh, particular quote by Frank Pascal uh, in his book on the effects of uh, machine learning and AI in society, the black box society. So how we are categorized through data affects how we will be traced, treated. So a lot of discussion uh, in the previous uh, section that Ankur talked about and in the subsequent sections will be framed around unpacking what this means. Uh, so for example, Ankur talked about uh, data encoding. Um, so there are questions regarding who is encoding the data and why is the encoding being done? Uh, for example, there are government regulations, uh, uh, say with respect to reimbursement, it could be because of certain stereotypes uh, or just the definition of outcome itself. Uh, so it's a recurring theme that will uh, come into play again and again. Okay, so as Dr. Ankur walked us through in the introduction, um, and I hope it's clear to everyone that discrimination in healthcare has existed for centuries. Um, you know, much in advance of the um, incorporation of AI and machine learning techniques in healthcare. So when we talk about discrimination in healthcare, um, what are we talking about? So we have some definitions here to just sort of, um, you know, set the stage. So discrimination is actually the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people, um, usually patients when we're talking about healthcare especially on the grounds of protected features. <clears throat> now, as we um, will continue to show throughout the course of this tutorial, um, there's many protected features and surrogates for such as well. Um, race, age, and sex are commonly used as sort of axes of discrimination um, in some of the examples we'll be discussing today. And two of really the key um, sort of issues around discrimination are that of disparate treatment and disparate impact. There's a litany of um, legal courses and scholarly work around these two terms. Um, we've tried to kind of simplify them here and describe their relevance to healthcare, which we'll be continuing to reference. So disparate treatment is actually when 
the treatment assigned to a particular patient or person is dependent on their class membership. So this is usually sort of correlated with or similar to implicit bias, which unfortunately in the literature, um, we know physicians and other clinical providers do tend to have implicit biases that, that can actually affect their treatment decisions. And there's quite a bit of work that looks at how differences in treatment are actually assigned to patients um, based on some of their protected features and the implicit biases that those providers have. So we tend to think about dis disparate treatment as actually being something that, um, you know, that is sort of assigned to that class. Disparate impact is um, a little bit kind of more difficult and that is that the treatment itself appears to be neutral. That is sort of, um, you know, you're perhaps providing the same treatment, but the impact is differential across the protected classes. So a really interesting example here has to do with geography, and that's in hospital relocation. There's been actually a number of legal cases around this and that some hospitals um, have chosen to relocate perhaps to um, more affluent areas of town or areas where um, you know, they're expected to have more uh, high revenue services delivered. And what that actually does is you know, that might seem like a reasonable course for hospitals to take. But of course, that can differentially affect uh, care for minority classes. So there's a real you know, balance there between how we think about um, you know, optimizing care delivery for some folks and how that then might have a disparate impact uh, on folks within the protected classes. Next. So as we think about fairness and predictive performance, there's a number of different um, sort of ways to consider this. Of course, we will talk about different ways to actually measure fairness in which um, specific metrics we will look at dependent on the use case provided. Of course, part of that is around how well is the model performing. There are specific use cases in healthcare where we want to optimize for recall or precision sort of based on, um, you know, how the, the action taken upon that model will actually affect um, the care delivery or the patient outcome. Calibration is also an important metric to consider when looking across fairness axes. Um, you know, not just how well is the model calibrated, but also looking across these groups. How well is it calibrated um, within each uh, category of race, for example. And intervention and allocation is an aspect that we'll come back to a few times here because I think it's very specific and really essential to healthcare. Um, you know, an ML model in healthcare is really only helpful if it's used, if it's usable, and if people are able to use it. Um, and when we think about when people take action on a healthcare model, there's so many steps in human behaviors and decisions that are really in a sequence um, before really a true outcome occurs. You know, let's say we're trying to reduce hospital readmission rates. Once a score is surfaced, um, there's still a number of different decisions that must be um, made and acted upon in order to actually reduce that readmission. <clears throat> so similarly with fairness, in addition to just how well is the model performing across protected groups, we actually have to think about how services that are allocated in response to that model are being used across these same protected groups. Next. So we mentioned the sort of legal precedent around protected classes and which features that tends to be. <clears throat> there are really a number of different um, sort of core features as well as proxies that we talk about in healthcare. Um, and really there's not gonna be an exhaustive list at this point because any data set, any specific population you're working on or a use case that is of interest, it's really important to think about the features available and what variables are in the data to think about how this actually affects the use case and which ones could be surrogates um, for protected classes. We have a list of some here. So of course we've mentioned things like age, sex, race, race and ethnicity. Um, but then there's, you know, issues like disease conditions, right? Which um, members might have, members or patients might have conditions um, that could be used to, um, you know, differentially provide tr treatment services or, or other therapies. <clears throat> Cost of care is an important surrogate that we'll touch on a couple of times. Um, there's been some examples in um, the literature as well as the popular press around machine learning algorithms that have used cost of care as a surrogate for a sort of socioeconomic status that has um, had interesting outcomes as well. Next, please. So an issue which is related to uh, these protected classes and proxy variables is that, so we can ask these questions within the context of 
uh, model performance and fairness. So for example, if you're seeing differences in performance, then what are the different sources of that difference? Uh, so it could be because that the in the data set, we have access to a limited set of features, uh, the distributions uh, are skewed, uh, or it could be that um, that the models that we are working, the algorithms that we are working with, they're making certain assumptions regarding the distributions of the data. For example, uh, it's Gaussian, but in reality, that is not the case. Uh, the data set itself, uh, for example, not just the features, but let's say in the number of records which are available, that's limited. Um, and it, especially with respect to the minority class, uh, so that can definitely affect performance uh, and hence uh, fairness. And even beyond that, we also have to look at uh, how the performance is with respect to uh, different uh, different uh, models with respect to different subpopulations. So basically how the error is distributed across uh, populations, uh, whether we're looking at say precision recall or positive rates or, or negative rates, uh, which we will talk about in a couple of slides. Uh, and then also, um, are there, uh, what is the source of disparity between the predictive outcomes? Um, it could be because of, uh, maybe there are certain proxies as Dr. Carly just talked about. And also there are external processes which are just not captured by the, the data per, per se. Uh, so if you are seeing differences in the distributions and also with respect to say the model performances, uh, so maybe it's because we just don't have access to rich enough data or there is something, some other processes which are affecting uh, that. And just to sort of bring us back to the run-in example that was mentioned during the introduction, um, we have here effectively two patients that are um, similar but for their race who are both experiencing um, a similar medical emergency. So effectively, both of these two men, uh, one black, one white, are having um, acute coronary syndrome or a heart attack. And we're thinking about them being treated um, by a similar physician or similar provider and an actual difference in how they're treated. Um, so, you know, in, in healthcare, there's there's algorithms for treatment, just like, um, you know, just like the algorithms that computer scientists are used to that sort of walk you through the steps of care um, based upon best practices. And for a heart attack, that can either be medications, um, procedures, or actual surgical procedures. Um, and what we see in what this paper cites is that actually in a specific time, type of heart attack, that being um, a non-STEMI for those that are interested, um, we actually do see uh, differential sort of care provided to patients um, of different races. So just, we'll kind of keep coming up with these examples, but just some, um, some things to keep in mind as we talk about these different measures of uh, fairness. Uh, so fairness in ML has been an area of active research um, uh, for at least for a decade or so. And so especially uh, if you look at the different notions of uh, fairness, uh, uh, so the lit if, uh, doing a survey of the literature, so one sees that especially starting from the late 2000s up until late 2010s, uh, we do see that uh, different researchers uh, from several domains have, within the context of uh, uh, classification, have put forward several definitions of fairness. And over the course of several years, what researchers have realized is that for most practical purposes and for most use cases, uh, many of these definitions are equivalent to one another. Um, and they can be put under umbrella of six, uh, quote unquote, canonical definitions. Uh, so here we will focus on these definitions as they relate to, um, to uh, as they relate to healthcare. Um, and then talk about some of these uh, systematically. Uh, so the first one is unawareness, uh, which is basically the idea that do not include the sensitive attribute as a feature in the training data. So which in our previous example, um, of, uh, of cardiovascular differences uh, between the two male patients. Uh, so that would be equivalent of not using that particular uh, metric. Uh, 
or so, sorry, not using that particular feature in your model. So, um, Muhammad, you mean um, excluding race from the feature set? That is correct, yes. Uh, so that said, there is a problem with, uh, with that particular approach, which is that there could be other features within your data set, uh, which are in fact proxies for race. So although you may have explicitly excluded race, uh, it may implicitly still be including in your, in your data. Uh, so beyond that, uh, so there's another set of uh, three different notions of uh, fairness, which are collectively known as group fairness. So these constitute in this table, uh, demographic parity, equalized odds, and uh, predictive rate parity, uh, usually contrasted with the notions of uh, individual fairness. Uh, so we will go discuss this, each of these in turn. Uh, so demographic parity, so the idea behind demographic parity is that in terms of the outcome, the outcomes must be, be equal. And then there's, there's a legal precedent for this in what is known as the four-fifth rule. Um, the prob, uh, so one way to think about it is that, uh, for example, we ensure that uh, the positive rates, uh, which in the context of healthcare, for example, uh, we could map that onto rate of interventions. So they are same across uh, different groups defined by race in our example. Uh, that said, it also suffers from the same, or not the same, but similar problem of correlation between the variables. Uh, another notion uh, of uh, group fairness is what is known as equalized odds. Uh, which is that we ensure that uh, when we are scoring individual instances from our model, uh, it treats different groups with uh, similar odds. Uh, so that's just another way of saying that all other factors or features equal, uh, the prediction that we will get is that should be very similar. So that is uh, problematic on several fronts. Um, so now suppose uh, we are dealing with a historically disadvantaged population. Um, uh, again, going back to our example, uh, the cardiovascular example. Uh, so we know that uh, historically our models performed relatively poor on black population uh, versus the white population. And so if you just go with equalized odds, then that would uh, imply, and because we have have uh, poor performance uh, or even before model building, uh, what that will lead towards is that that uh, inequality would be per perpetuated by our model. Uh, so the next notion of uh, predictive rate parity is, um, is that the performance of the predictive model should be the same across different groups. Uh, so as the definition uh, or the description shows, it is, we can also think of this as a way to remedy the, the limitations of uh, uh, equalized odd or positive rate parity. Um, uh, so these three taken together constitute uh, group fairness. Um, and on the other side, so there's what is known as individual fairness. And when, when, uh, when a lot of people, especially the layperson, thinks about fairness, this is the notion of fairness that they are thinking about, uh, which is that similar individuals should be treated uh, similarly. So but the idea is that instead of focusing on the groups, uh, we focus on the individuals. Uh, one problem with this is that, uh, how do we define similarity? Uh, like what features are we going to use to define that? And even if we could uh, magically, uh, let's say, reduce the set of features that we're going to use, then we still have to determine the relative importance of uh, the features to give in our model. Um, and who gets to decide what those uh, features are? Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why, uh, for a lot of use cases, uh, it's somewhat discouraged to use individual uh, fairness. Uh, the last notion of fairness is also one of the most, as compared to the other notions of fairness, more difficult ones to uh, capture and compute, uh, especially in certain contexts, is the counterfactual fairness. With the idea is that 
focus on how will the outcome change if the values of sensitive variables change. Uh, and the motivation, motivation behind this is relatively straightforward that um, it's that with this particular notion of fairness, it would also be possible to check uh, what's the possible impact of re replacing say one uh, sensitive attribute uh, or and just focusing on that. Uh, so that said, as I just mentioned, uh, it, it's, that is in a very ideal scenario. In practice, it's, it is extremely difficult uh, to check, especially if we are dealing with a large number of features. Um, uh, so that's why um, if you look at the literature, then uh, in terms of real world examples uh, uh, for counterfactual fairness versus say group fairness, or even individual fairness, they, one does not find as much uh, discussion in, and even results in literature regarding that. All right, so which brings us to the impossibility theorem of uh, fairness. Uh, so the different notions of fairness that we just encountered, uh, so just to highlight again, uh, so these three notions of fairness, demographic parity, uh, predictive parity and equalized odds, uh, uh, it has been shown uh, mathematically uh, by results uh, that uh, it's not possible to satisfy all of these different notions of uh, fairness at the same time. Um, so when so going back to the development of literature around fairness, uh, so when researchers were coming up with different notions of fairness uh, in, in early 2010s to uh, mid 2010s, uh, so there was this, this hope that uh, it may be uh, possible to maybe describe certain ideal scenarios and ideal conditions where one could satisfy these different notions of fairness. It turns out that that is actually not possible. Uh, uh, so which means that the best that one could do is focus on individual use cases and individual contexts and pick and choose what notions of fairness are specifically applicable and try to optimize for those. And the ones which we could not uh, satisfy maybe have a weak satisfaction satisfaction criteria for those. Uh, again, not ideal, but uh, that is uh, like many other things in, in the real world, that is the world that we are living in. Uh, so which brings us to uh, data bias. Um, that is, uh, so as Ankur mentioned in, uh, earlier, uh, if you look at the literature on uh, bias, there are many notions of bias that one can think, think of. And we can literally have a whole tutorial talking about bias for the next uh, eight hours, uh, but because that's not the focus of this tutorial, we will not go into that. Uh, that said, uh, there are several notions of uh, data bias uh, uh, beyond what Ankur also talked about earlier uh, that that are very relevant, especially within the context that we are dealing with. Uh, so differences or focusing on differences with respect to say populations, demographics, uh, behaviors, uh, and then also across the orthogonal dimension of uh, temporality. Um, so that is, are these characteristics changing over time? Um, and uh, uh, also, um, uh, con content production bias. So within the context of healthcare, so that would be that, uh, are there differences with respect to say the processes which generates the labels and how it is encoded uh, and uh, how it's actually used by the model. Um, and then there are also, uh, we can also talk about biases from the perspective of how information is consumed and acti acted upon um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then of course there are biases, uh, classical biases from the statistical literature regarding uh, sampling biases, uh, uh, also skewness of data, uh, stratified versus unstratified sampling, um, and uh, things like self-selection bias. So in case of studies, um, are there participants who are not uh, participating and for what reasons? I just wanna add a few, um clinical aspects to that prior slide, Mohammed. Um, so one of the really important things when we're thinking about how the data is collected that we're using is um, thinking about the, let's say we're looking at 
an electronic health record to extract from a large hospital. Um, it's really thinking about how that reflects the community in which the hospital um, is serving. We know, for example, that um, patients of particularly particular classes um, actually tend to have more fractured care. That is, they might seek care at multiple different facilities or among multiple different providers um, instead of actually having a real continuity of care. And this could be for a number of reasons, whether it be you know, requiring to, to move um, uh, to different houses or different locations, whether it might be um, changing jobs and changing insurance coverage. But what we know is that um, this fractured footprint in the data is actually more common among certain classes. And so, you know, when you think about um, what kind of signal you might have for, um, you know, patients, it can actually be quite differential across um, different socioeconomic and demographic groups. Thank you, Dr. Carly, for adding the uh, context. Uh, so beyond the data bias, uh, as Ankur talked about earlier, uh, there are other aspects uh, to focus on. So uh, there's the algorithmic bias uh, that we alluded to earlier, uh, also feeds into uh, these metrics of fairness. But uh, even beyond that, uh, uh, taking into account the downstream consequences of model choice or even hyperparameter choice, uh, so there are studies with respect to how uh, when something as seemingly innocent as hyperparameter choice can lead to uh, different results uh, in terms of how biased or unbiased the model is. Um, and they're also baked in agro algorithmic assumptions uh, that can lead towards more biased models versus others. Uh, so think about uh, naive based, so assumptions regarding uh, conditional independence of variables. Um, so it's also from our experience that that uh, would lead to more biased models. Uh, not that you would actually use that uh, in most real world examples, but just to illustrate a straightforward example of where that kind of bias can creep in from. Uh, there's also a composition or team bias, uh, which uh, one could think about that from the perspective of uh, the human factor in the in on the model building side. Um, so, are there knowledge gaps within the team? Uh, so that will affect can take into effect how information is encoded and processed uh, within the model. Also, within say the pipeline and downstream, um, are there are the are the stakeholders or people who will be affected by the models? Are they being consulted? Are they part of the model building process? Uh, so these are the kind of conversations and questions that one should, uh, one needs to be take into account. So <clears throat> I want to talk about um, how we think about outcomes and the clinical perspective with regards to bias and fairness. Um, I mentioned sort of these three um, buckets earlier in the presentation, and this actually draws from um, the Rajkumar paper cited below that actually talks about the three um, axes of distributive justice in um, fairness in healthcare. And it's a, it's a really good paper and this is a, an important concept. Um, so I wanna walk through an example um, with regard to these three sort of uh, uh, tracks. <clears throat> so for, um, there's a good, there's an interesting problem in healthcare that's around medication adherence. So, you know, patients who are, have chronic conditions often require chronic use of medications, whether that be to control their blood glucose in the case of diabetes, or to control their blood pressure for those who have hypertension. There's you know, any number of medical conditions that require chronic medication use. Um, however, actually a surprisingly you know, low number of people actually regularly take their medications. Um, and so actually predicting patients who will you know, regularly and faithfully take medications is an important predictive problem. Um, so kind of using that as an example here, when we think about um, model performance, you know, we've already mentioned this, right? But sort of thinking about the six metrics for, um, for parity and fairness across um, actual model performance. So is the model performing you know, accurately and with sufficient recall and precision across these different protected groups? Um, and you could imagine you know, a care manager or someone in um, working at a physician's office sort of being tasked with, with um, you know, making decisions based upon the performance of a model that predicts medication adherence. Um, and when we think about allocation of services, that's actually, you know, how does that care manager choose to act upon that model? You know, there's, you know, there's certainly a good chance, right, that, they, that we've talked about things like dismissal bias, 
<clears throat> and that might be, you know, the, the younger patients, the 30 year olds, you know, they're never going to take their medications. <laughs> you know, it's, I can, I can call them and I can have these very time intensive interventions. Um, you know, but it, the care manager might, for example, right, not think that there's having much of a clinical outcome and effect based on, on the actions that are being taken. Um, you know, similarly, there is actually privilege bias, right, where those, those members who um, that care manager might have experience with that says, oh, you know what, this, this model says that these folks are going to have lower performance, but I've taken care of them, I know them, or in the past they haven't had a problem, so I'm not going to worry about calling them. So really, um, just sort of to emphasize this point that how the services are allocated um, can have just as big or even a, a larger impact upon how fairness, when we think about clinical outcomes, really the ultimate outcome of how a machine learning model should, um, should impact care is highly dependent, of course, on, on fairness at the level of the, uh, the provider. This is another figure from the same paper. And this figure does a good job of kind of helping us visualize the many different kinds of bias. You know, as Muhammad has elucidated, there are really dozens of different types of bias um, that can be present both in the data and how the data is collected um, in the algorithms and which ones we choose and how they, they use the data and then actually in the, the model results. So, you know, when we think about <clears throat> how is the missingness applied how is um, the data missing this distributed across different protective features? Do younger patients have more fractured care? So we actually have less, um, less details about them. Um, in healthcare, we know that sicker patients certainly have heavier footprints. Um, you know, there's many tests that are only run on sick patients. <clears throat> and so how do we sort of think about missing data and what does that do to our models? Of course, there's also um, label bias. So sometimes the outcome is actually missing in the data. And then how does those distributions actually then affect um, a model in deployment when we may be seeing a you know, different distribution um, than that which is in the training set? We've talked a little bit here a few times now about the different clinical interactions and how they can actually then bias the clinical outcome. Um, so automation bias is, of course, as we mentioned, you know, just, just sort of blindly following that Google Maps alert on your phone. Um, you know, sometimes we, we you know, truly believe that uh, AI in healthcare is assistive and that it should be sort of one more arrow in the quiver of a doctor's skill set. It should sort of add to that training that has already been instilled. Um, but you can certainly, you know, see times when, when that automation bias comes into play. Uh, next. <clears throat> So that's uh, uh, so that said. So also taking a systems uh, perspective. Uh, so we can also talk about trade-offs in fairness in uh, machine learning, um, especially within the context of healthcare. There are two dimensions uh, where which are especially relevant. Uh, so one is uh, performance versus fairness. Uh, and the other one is fairness versus explainability, uh, and. Uh, so for, especially for the explainability, the literature on explainability uh, and uh, performance and even fairness, uh, so there seems to be an inverse relationship between these uh, quantities. Um, so the question arises that within the context of healthcare, uh, how do, what do we optimize and what are the use cases and what are the main uh, uh, points of consider consideration that we should uh, focus on. Uh, so, in, uh, uh, so this is a general statement, uh, so not, not to be held in terms of a mathematical law, but in general, uh, it's, what's been observed is that uh, uh, fairness negatively impacts performance. Uh, so again, to emphasize that's not always the case, but this is, again, a general observation from uh, different, multiple studies, people's uh, practical experiences, and the reason for that is that uh, if we look at the objective or the standard formulation of objective functions for any machine learning model, uh, then the objective is to maximize performance, uh, where performance could be defined in terms of any metric precision, recall, AUC, buyer score, so on and so forth. Uh, and so because that is the case, any deviation from that is, is going to uh, result in loss in performance with respect to that particular metric. Um, 
that's just the inherent uh, reality uh, or or the or the result of focus focusing on defining uh, uh, fairness uh, in this particular way. So when we think about um, sort of Western, Western medicine and some of the clinical um, tenants or uh, some of the, the, the ethical tenants that we're trained in, um, beneficence is one of those really four core tenants. And that's really um, the principle that, that you are doing everything you can to improve the situation for the patient in front of you. Um, and truly, you know, that's what physicians and clinicians are trained to do is to, to try to really optimize the care for that patient that's before you. Um, and so we've, as we've talked about, there's certainly a challenge in fairness of how do we balance um, the performance with, with fairness. Um, and, you know, the removal or reduction of, um, of some features might actually reduce the predicted performance in order to ensure fairness across the model. Um, you know, but that might come at a cost to truly that patient before you. Um, there may be ways that you know, including those additional features and actually reducing fairness could help that individual. Um, and so that is certainly one of the challenges uh, that's yet to be resolved. Next. So the other trade-off that uh, is of interest is uh, the trade-off between uh, fairness and explainability. Uh, so in a lot of healthcare related decisions, uh, the end user, uh, it could be a clinician, it could be a nurse or a healthcare worker, uh, that many of the end users, they are less likely to trust uh, trust their recommendation or the prediction from the machine learning model if it's a black box. So hence the need for explainability. Uh, so that said, uh, so work in, in terms of empirical work and even theoretical results, um, work in this area uh, with respect to the trade-off between these two uh, is somewhat in its infancy. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, uh, people's personal experiences, uh, but not much in terms of uh, rigorous empirical studies uh, or theoretical results uh, regarding the trade-offs. There are, that said, there are a couple of not notable exceptions. And what, the, what those papers, what they are saying is that um, the relationship between these two is actually not in worse, uh, but it's rather somewhat complex. Uh, so if you look at the relationship between, so let's say, protective features uh, versus non-protective ones uh, versus features and outcome variables. Uh, so it's a non-straightforward relationship between these two. Uh, one result, uh, at least on uh, certain uh, uh, types of data sets which has been uh, established is that uh, the trade-offs that we see uh, or at least, or not just see, but also expect with respect to interpretability and, and fairness, they actually do not uh, apply to or depend if the data set uh, is uh, imbalanced. Uh, so what we are seeing in this figure uh, is actually a result from a paper by uh, Jabari and others. Uh, so one thing that they observed was that uh, if you look at, uh, uh, so on the x-axis, so it's the complexity of the model, which is defined in terms of the features uh, or the set of features, and it's uh, a multiple of that uh, being used versus uh, fairness vi violations uh, with respect to uh, different metrics. Uh, if certain conditions of fairness, the model is being uh, is violating those uh, conditions. And what we see observe is that the relationship is not uh, straightforward. Uh, so again, to emphasize, this is this area is somewhat in its infancy, and the results are are still coming. And uh, the big, if we were to talk about a big picture, then a big picture is still emerging. So I'd say, from kind of the clinical perspective on this, that it's really important to continue to remember that you know the goal for machine learning, one of the goals, right, is to make these models um, usable, useful, and and used. I would say, right, you really want to make um, we want to enable their application in these healthcare settings. And we know that physicians and providers um, really have a need and a desire to explain how models work, um, right? Sometimes they also prefer parsimonious models. Um, so it's interesting to think about how sort of that need and that desire for truly explainable models and models that are 
you know, perhaps um, have a reduced number of features um, might improve the sort of usability of that model in a clinical setting, but may also impact fairness. Um, so this is again kind of emphasizing that need for education across um, across the users and the stakeholders to talk about this trade-off and to make sure that they understand sort of you know how these three um, really tenants of, of ML are coming together. And then there are also trade-offs uh, with respect to the long-term effects of uh, fairness. Uh, that's another uh, somewhat neglected area of research uh, within the context of fairness, um, uh, mainly because it's a problem which is extremely hard to uh, not just uh, address, but also formulate, uh, like finding healthcare data uh, across which across the span of time, uh, which satisfies conditions with respect to, uh, say, intervention, machine learning or AI-based interventions, um, and trying to impose fairness, given that it's a race, fairly recent uh, issue with respect to uh, systems uh, which are in production and actively affecting the lives of people. Uh, uh, so there's not, uh, if I were to make a general statement, then it's, an area where there's not enough uh, research or results which are out there. So that said, we can still ask questions regarding, um, in terms of a research agenda, like what are the circumstances uh, where, with respect to say different uh, criteria of fairness that we have talked about that, they promote the long-term well-being of the protected groups over time. So going back to the cardiovascular example of the two uh, males from different groups, then we can talk about interventions right now, but uh, what about a series of interventions over the course of time which maximize utility, which maximizes the well being of the person? So, we can, there are different ways to address this. So, think about that as a multi objective uh, problem, uh, optimizing against uh, several metrics. Uh, uh, and the problem is non trivial because these metrics, these ob objectives may interact with one another and complicate the outcome. Um, so that said, uh, there are a couple, of, a couple of papers which address this, uh, a couple of formulations which talk about, say, what if there's a feedback, feed, one, let's say one step uh, feedback loop. Um, and because they are not, um, as I uh, talked about it earlier, because they are not data sets which are rich enough, uh, most of this work is done with respect to uh, or via simulations and trying to figure out uh, with respect to different policies, what would be the optimal um, outcome. Uh, so at this point uh, in the interest of time, um, so we are 13 minutes above after the, what was supposed to be the break of uh, the, the coffee break. So in, uh, this would be a great uh, midpoint to, uh, uh, to stop. Um, again, if there are questions, please feel free to uh, add them to the chat and uh, let's reconvene at uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Sounds good. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, so 3 p.m. So everyone stretch your legs, use this as a bio break, and we'll come back.
<clears throat> All right, folks, uh, it's now uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, so let's start with the second half of our section. So welcome back. So as, as we continue to talk about um, issues with fairness, one of the sort of other issues is to consider how well people will be um, sort of represented in the data that we're collecting. Um, you know, one of the sort of protected classes we haven't talked much about is actually um, the disabled or those with a disability. Um, and it's important to think about, you know, oftentimes we collect data and we formulate our machine learning predictions based on these so-called, you know, normal populations. Um, and among these protected classes, um, such as those with a disability or those that are differently abled, um, there's actually issues around confidentiality and protection that would, um, you know, potentially make it a problem to actually um, collect the adequate data to formulate and to model these predictive problems. Next. One of the other interesting issues with healthcare is um, the problem around uh, how we think about labels and how the actual target label for a prediction, predictive task um, might be differentially collected. <clears throat> There's of course sort of what we would call hard outcomes, things like death that are usually and almost invariably um, you know, labeled in the data, although you'd be surprised. <laughs> uh, but there's often other, you know, outcomes that we're interested in predicting or in modeling that are really um, quite subjective and might be inconsistently collected. So we've listed some here, things like mental health evaluation, psychological assessments, pain assessment is a very interesting one, um, and patient reported outcomes. So these, as you, you know, I'm sure can, can realize are really critical um, and interesting outcomes for clinicians and clinical researchers to consider. Um, but they are quite subjective and are um, and also sort of differentially collected. Um, functional outcomes is also another very important, um, you know, you can imagine when you're looking at outcomes following joint replacements or, um, you know, in trauma patients, thinking about, you know, how pain is controlled and how is function returned, that actually just making sure that the label is correctly um, identified and collected across groups um, is, is critical for proper modeling. Next. So this is actually a slide looking at um, a clinical problem known as pressure ulcers or pressure injuries. <clears throat> so pressure ulcers and injuries are actually effectively damaged to the skin that is caused by um, an array of sort of host factors, I would say. So things like, um, you know, some chronic illness, occasionally um, poor nutritional status, aging, things like that, and also com combined with um, sort of sites of care issues. So folks who, you know, may be bed bound or recovering from a surgical procedure or intervention for a prolonged time period, and they actually develop these, these pressure ulcers or wounds um, at various sort of high contact or um, hot spots on their body. Um, the actual outcome here is, is what's called a, a Braden scale rating for a pressure ulcer. So that's actually how we think about them clinically is, is what stage is this ulcer? <clears throat> and there's actually a highly subjective score. So you can see in the figure here, we actually elucidate or, or walk you through each of these different stages of a deep tissue injury, which then becomes a pressure ulcer. Um, and just the subjective coding of this, um, you know, is a highly subjective, subjective uh, label. Next. All right. Uh, so that brings us to uh, a now classic study on uh, the dangers of relying too much on labels, uh, especially within the context of healthcare. Uh, so this, uh, this is a study by uh, Ziad uh, Obermeyer. So the objective is that, uh, so given uh, x-rays and labels associated with these x-rays, uh, which the, where the labels are, the severity of the disease, uh, so we have to predict, uh, say, given new instances, what the severity of the disease is. Uh, so one thing, so there are a few things which stand out. Uh, so if we focus on some of these graphs on the left, uh, so the breakdown with respect to race by education, uh, 
uh, income, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so we think, see things like, say, there's a larger share of people of uh, color or people who come from low income or education uh, with uh, respect to reporting uh, severe pain. Uh, you know, one possible explanation one could say that, well, maybe that is because uh, such populations are likely to suffer from more painful uh, conditions uh, as compared to other populations. However, uh, we still have to explain why the um, what other factors could be at play, why we are seeing these gaps across across populations. Uh, so, if we so these researchers they scrutinized uh, uh, this data set even further, and what they observed was that even if you look at two two uh, patients with uh, let's say very similar X rays. And uh, the, these patterns still hold true. Uh, so there's, so A, what that shows is that there's an element of subjectivity. And also uh, we can zoom in and into this even further. Uh, so uh, let's see, uh, so let's, let's focus on how are we, uh, how are we arriving at these labels? So, um, we think about the process. So there's a person, there's a patient who complains about the pain in their knee. The doctor orders an X-ray. Uh, it looks normal, and the doctor decides that well, maybe there's some other cause. Uh, and the way that it's done is that so there's a there's a checklist uh, based on which uh, the physician scores or grades the X-ray. So it turns out that that scale is actually based on a study done by researchers in Lancashire uh, in the 1950s on and on uh, coal miners. Uh, so if we look at the underlying population, then there's uh, almost no heterogeneity. Uh, so there's uh, all, all, all the participants are white male. Um, and so it is a, pop, a population from the 1950s, uh, mostly white, mostly English. Uh, so that leads us, that lead then to the question, could it be that the doctors are under diagnosis knee problems um, amongst a certain segment of the population uh, because the model that they're using and how these things are being labeled are outdated and not representative of the population? So to remedy th this uh, issue, what they did was they actually, uh, instead of using the labels as they were given to them, they actually asked the patients um, directly uh, to report their level of pain. And sure enough, when they went back, the perform and retrained the models, the performance of the models in terms of their accuracy and, and effectiveness that improved significantly. Um, so that's that that's a cautionary tale with respect to uh, thinking about the whole process of how the, how the data and the labels and just how even the whole ecosystem of the domain can uh, unknowingly conspire to create biased results. Muhammad, there's a question from Prasanna uh, on the data, like the equity versus fairness. Um, we could probably take a moment to address it and then go to the next one. Um, sure. Yeah, I can um, at least start the discussion if that's okay. Uh, so yeah, I think it's, a good, it's a good question. So Prasanna is asking about how do we balance equity um, with fairness and from your the sort of stem of your question related to emergency care um, and you know what if um, you know how do we how do we balance those two? Um, what I think you're kind of getting at is how do we look at the equity of services that are allocated um, and what if that's in tension with fairness of a model? Um, so one of the sort of solutions to this that I've seen is that the allocation of services, which I think we're sort of, as we think about equity, is dependent on the sort of number of positive examples or the number of positive um, predictions in the um, resulting from the model algorithm. And so you can actually differentially um, modify the threshold um, for certain protected groups. 
to ensure that then, you know, the group where you're promoting equity or where you're trying to eliminate inequity um, might then have a larger number of positive samples um, from which then services can be allocated. Um, Please let me know if I'm or sort of reading your question the right way, um, or Ankur or Muhammad, feel free to um, add to what I've said. Yeah, uh, thank you for that uh, answer. I, uh, yeah, I think it partly answers my uh, question. And I was also, uh, the two parts of the question, one is, um, the, I understand, for example, that explainability and performance uh, kind of are inversely proportional, but with fairness, um, it might be, if our fairness measure is not accounting for equity, uh, then even though our uh, policy, healthcare policy uh, procedures are geared towards equity, then there, there is a uh, mismatch between what we are uh, treating versus what we are measuring. Right, and even though your fairness might indicate a lower performance, but if you're actually treating someone in the right way with respect to equity, uh, you're actually doing the right thing. And I guess that will also depend upon, uh, uh, or the answer to that would be dependent upon the use case. Uh, so in certain use cases, uh, you would want to maximize for equity versus in other use cases, you would want to maximize for certain notions of uh, fairness more than others. Yeah, I think that also emphasizes the point of sort of having all the, which we'll come to in a bit around having all the right stakeholders, you know, in the room from the beginning when you're thinking about, about models and fairness and bias and equity, because um, like Mohammed said, I think it's very use case dependent. Um, Okay, thank you. That helps. Um, so the um, one more point to consider is again from a like my 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 perspective is very production focused and operational focused, and uh, you know while training the model, you can take certain measures to ensure fairness, like what Dr. Carly mentioned in terms of thresholds uh, for various protected classes. Uh, but eventually at the end point or the delivery end point as the output of the model goes in the hand of clinicians as say clinical decision support, uh, the, the as long as that output or the recommended intervention is equitable for that context, and have not given any special, um, uh, you know, uh, special bias into account while recommending the intervention. So let's take, say, uh, sodium titration levels for diabetics, right? As long as you have a, like, you know, one defense that we have seen on Twitter very recently is, oh, you know, if the underlying data set uh, did not have different values of sodium titration across different races, then there is no chance for a predictive model to get it right because I just don't know all the choices that a clinician could make for different races and ethnicities, right? Now, that's where the question of inequity starts coming in because uh, if you're designing a clinical decision support system and it is the responsibility of the AI framework to come up with the right intervention for the clinical decision support, then, you know, ensuring that it is not, it is the, the, the output of the model is not just dependent on the data bias or uh, on the algorithmic bias, but also ensuring that physician variability is taken into account by the model, uh, knowing fully well how that particular individual physician tends to pick and choose the interventions uh, depending on what protective class they are treating can also be uh, captured and institutionalized in the, in the predictive frame framework, right? So you can do a variation analysis across physicians who are doing those interventions. And, and we are doing this in some large scale uh, 
uh, studies where we are accommodating for physician variation uh, and observing the effects of recommended interventions uh, across those physicians. So when you take a overlapping set of physician decisions that were made and the AI recommendations that came from the data, you start seeing cohorts and subsets where there is higher inequity compared to other cohorts and subsets. And that then those errors uh, then help you identify how you can make the overall system more equitable, uh, if it makes sense, over a period of time. Again, you have to put a window of time, you have to say, okay, six months, and I will reach this bar, or I will mitigate these errors in the intervention protocol uh, over a period of one year and observe that as the longitudinal data. So again, these are some of the sort of tricks and solutions that we are trying to, uh, you know, understand and then put in place. Uh, thanks. Uh, one last comment. I think you made an interesting point, Uncle. Is um, again, I'm thinking on top of my head. Is that what you're also saying? Is fairness is uh, has to be measured not just at individual decision points but there has to be an overall fairness of the care path because the patient uh, has a care plan or a care path that he undergoes over a period of time. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Yeah, it, yeah. it's not in the context. Like the context has to be uh, broader in terms of the overall journey of the patient. Acknowledged. Thank you. Okay, so as we continue, um, this brings us to kind of the generalization of data and how some of this lack of generalization may promote um, issues of uh, unfairness, inequity, and bias. So the citation on the right here is actually around um, breast cancer diagnosis across different geographies and groups of women. Um, it's referencing kind of a difference in uh, age and cancer type or sort of characteristics of that cancer um, and how you know, tools trained on European women um, may you know, promote um, bias when the same tools applied among Sub-Saharan African women. Um, there's, of course, you know, issues among um, acquiring data from certain, um, certain groups of patients, particularly those who have been sort of subjugated in the past. Um, and so even just accessing that data can be an issue, but it's also important that the group is adequately represented in the training data in order to have an unfair, an, a fair and unbiased model. Um, of course, we don't have to look to actually, um, you know, low-income countries to find examples of this. Um, even looking at diabetes diagnosis and diabetes care in our own country, we can see examples. Uh, you know, based on geography, there's very different um, sort of trends and patterns in diabetic risk. Um, type 2 diabetes can is due to a whole host of um, both familial and uh, geographic and environmental issues. And we know, for example, that um, in the Southwest, this can sort of be a disease of, of it can uh, start quite young actually in our, in our 30s and 40s um, and have you know, very long-term effects and can be um, you know, more of a, an older issue in, in other parts of the country. So this is certainly something that is uh, predominant as well in our own country. So from the issue of uh, dealing with fairness in data, so we uh, slightly uh, shift focus to uh, some of the issues that we encounter uh, when dealing with the models themselves. Um, some are also related to the uh, notion of generalization within uh, models themselves is the, is the issue of uh, calibration. Uh, so well, if we think about a well-calibrated model in general, uh, so the idea is that, uh, uh, so especially if we are considering uh, classification models where the output is a, a predictive probability. And so if you look at the subset of population, so the idea behind calibration is that uh, for a set of people uh, or instances with a predicted probability of P, then there should be a 
p fraction of its uh, members of this set, uh, which actually uh, have that uh, particular uh, positive outcome. Um, uh, so in general, uh, calibration is considered to be an important uh, property to have for classifiers. Uh, and so if we were to map this within the context of healthcare, uh, then suppose we say we are dealing with two different groups. So let's say African-Americans versus white patients uh, and then connecting back to our notions of uh, fairness, group fairness that we encountered earlier. Uh, then what we, ideally what we would want is that we want our models to be calibrated uh, within uh, these different populations and also across these uh, populations. And so one result, uh, theoretical result, which has come um, out is that it's actually not always possible uh, under many conditions to actually have models which are well calibrated as well as models which are fair. So to delve into one, uh, one such uh, example, one such case where that happens is what we like to call the other impossibility theorem of fairness. To consider the following. So I just described the, uh, the notion of, um, of uh, calibration. So version of that uh, is uh, group calibration. So suppose we are considering several groups uh, and then within B, within each there are several bins of predicted probabilities uh, associated with certain scores. And so across these groups, uh, uh, we expect or we want uh, our model to be uh, well calibrated uh, in terms of say, yeah, for the, for the po positive outcome class, the fraction of uh, the expected number of, uh, of people or patients across groups uh, should be the same. So now uh, for different, uh, for several notions of uh, fairness, so we also have, usually have the requirement that, uh, uh, let's say uh, the average score assigns to people across groups who belong to say the positive class or the negative class, these being two different requirements should be the same. Uh, so in another result from Kleinberg, um, and others, uh, it says that it's actually not possible to satisfy all of these three different conditions. Uh, so again, another instance where uh, the ideal scenario, scenario where we want, uh, so the earlier result that we had was that it's not possible to satisfy all three canonical notions of group fairness. Here, what we have is that even if we want parity with respect to say positive, uh, uh, positive class, negative class, uh, and the average score associated with them and group calibration is just not possible to do so. Uh, so to the answer regarding, well, what should we optimize and uh, in what context, uh, the, at the end of the day, that is going to be very uh, context uh, and use case specific. Uh, so from that, uh, before coming back to um, these problems associated with uh, 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 with uh, model performance and fairness. Um, so now we zoom out to uh, larger problems which are not straightforward to address within the context of machine learning. Uh, so there are different notions of, so different notions of fairness have their groundings from different notions of how do we define fairness and justice. Uh, from uh, uh, from philosophy itself. So one notion, uh, and so many of these are derived from either from the what is known as the utilitarian perspective or the deontic uh, perspective. Uh, so the deontic perspective, it, what it says, or at least emphasizes is that what we should be concerned about is should not just be the current state of affairs uh, with respect to unfairness, but also how what are the conditions that led to that state in order to, to remedy that? Uh, but in our, so if we, for example, think, think about say systematic uh, discrimination and unfairness in society, um, and also that being relevant within the context of healthcare as problems that literally span centuries, uh, 
addressing those requires perspective from multiple uh, domains, uh, so from history, economics, sociology, so on and so forth. So it becomes a non-trivial problem. Um, and suppose even if we could identify them, then the question is, um, where's the local lo locus of responsibility? Uh, and one partial way to address is that instead of focusing on these things, just focusing on improving the outcomes. Um, and there are a host of other related questions that uh, say, in what circumstances can, that mistreatment with respect to say a particular dimension um, um, is worse than say mistreatment of the protected group as a whole in society. Um, I mean, not, not stating or implying that uh, mistreatment is fine in any way, but it's just a relative quote unquote badness of uh, different situations. Uh, if I were to summarize the main issue here, it would be that uh, it's extremely hard to model uh, strongly cu coupled uh, complex systems. So a related uh, meta question that one could ask is with respect to uh, uh, luck egalitarianism. So what does that mean? Uh, so if one of the goals is to rectify uh, unfairness and create a more equitable society, uh, then there are different types of uh, unequal distribution or or even outcomes that we can focus on. Uh, so there's inequality with, which comes as a result from, let's say, uh, people's efforts or risks taking. Um, and then there's inequality because of things which are beyond people's control. So let's say uh, their skin color, I say some, somebody's born with a certain debilitating health condition. Um, so that's, uh, that's just by luck. So how do we, uh, so in general, uh, most people think, tend to think of these as with, with respect to, well, if it is concerned with uh, luck egalitarianism, then we should rectify those conditions. But if it's by choice, then it, the locus of responsibility does not lie on us to remedy those situations. The problem is that real world is much more complex than that, uh, in, uh, that uh, your indiv our individual choices are not always our individual choices, they are constrained by external factors. So maybe uh, because uh, we have to take care of say the sick, the elderly, other family members, uh, something that a lot of us can relate to during the time of uh, COVID. Uh, so there's this need, what this means is that there's need to audit these systems um, and how um, stakeholders are affected. So again, not a very straightforward, trivial uh, answer to address this. Sure, so just to kind of continue on with the notion of representational fairness. Um, this is a really, uh, you know, I was sort of thinking back to medical school days and, um, you know, medical school is all about just, you know, memorizing information. Um, you know, they say it's like drinking from a water hose or um, sorry, from a fire hydrant. Um, and it's just a ton of information coming at you. And one of sort of the tricks that you learn is, is to formulate mnemonics around different um, disease states or conditions to really try to, you know, find um, relatively easy ways to, to memorize some of the information. And um, it really struck me when thinking about representational fairness is that um, these are effectively, you know, sort of st stereotypes, right, that we come up with to sort of formulate these pictures in our mind of groups of patients that might represent a disease state. Um, and a really good example is um, symptomatic cholelithiasis. So that is basically a condition where you have um, right upper quadrant pain resulting from gallstones. And ask, you know, any physician, right, and they can recite to you um, that this is typically found among um, fertile females in their 40s who are fair and have a family history, right? That's kind of the, uh, <laughs> the every, everybody who can, can, uh, can tell you that. So, you know, that's really might be kind of a silly example, but it's, a, I think, points to the fact that at least in, in medicine, we're very used to, unfortunately, some of these stereotypes, but they do help us think about um, conditions and those that tend to, to, to have them. Um, there's also this really interesting paper that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, just a few weeks ago that's actually looking at um, 
the use of race in certain um, clinical algorithms. And here they're looking at actually black kidney function. <clears throat> For those of you um, who might know, in clinical use, we talk a lot about how well um, kidneys function by referring the glomerular filtration rate, which is called GFR. Um, we can look back at studies used, studies from the 1970s that actually found differential um, GFRs among races, notably among um, those that are black and, and other races. Um, so actually there's a modifier that is in just about every electronic health record called an eGFR that's actually sort of adjusted for race. <clears throat> And that has been permeated really throughout, throughout healthcare, throughout medicine. Um, you know, the allocation of kidneys from transplant cases is dependent on eGFRs. Um, medication dosing is dependent on eGFRs. There's really, you know, very, um, it's, it's so dominant in, in medicine, I would say. So it's starting to kind of be, there's been like, you know, I would say a reckoning around many of these algorithms in medicine over the last few years really trying to think about, is this just a stereotype that was um, promoted from, you know, one study that, um, you know, sampled a handful of folks from different classes, <clears throat> or is this actually something, you know, biologic that we need to continue to model? Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of good papers that have come out recently on how we think about um, race and use it in some of our clinical care. Next. So Dr. Carly, before yes. we go to the next slide, uh, or maybe at the next slide, we should answer Sina's question on, on the chat. Okay. Yeah. Sure, so how do we differentiate between a model being unfair versus some of the actual differences in, bio, in biology between conditions? Is that the question? That's correct, yes. Yeah, and so I think um, I think you bring up a good point, and that is really one of the exciting things about ML and healthcare, right? Is that it can actually point to new avenues for scientific inquiry. Um, so, but this sort of completes it full circle, right? Where we're actually saying, um, how how do we know if we're modeling some new, if our model's picking up some new biologic trend, or if it's actually um, you know, not fair. So I would say this actually sort of goes back to epi um, and why there needs to be, you know, some notion. Um, one of the earlier slides actually talks about DAGs um, and thinking about, um, you know, actually biologic causality. Um, so I think this is a really good, I would say, plug to talk about including the stakeholders in model design and model building um, and actually thinking about some of the, bi the biology behind what you're trying to model. We do know certainly that there's going to be a different incidence of um, of disease, you know, based on sex and based on age. Um, but it's important that we're modeling that correctly and that what we're capturing is true um, true differences in biology. I also think you know there's there is a large body of literature, um, and that what we are finding, right? We should go back and sort of see how that is described um, in the literature. So, you know, if we are seeing that, you know, older people have a higher incidence of stroke in the data, you know, is that, um, is what we're seeing biologically true or is it sort of an artifact um, of a biased model, right? Well, I think that is a good point to really go back to the medical literature and say, oh yeah, you know, we do expect, you know, higher degrees of comorbidities and, um, you know, cholesterolemia and other things that would lead to an increased risk of stroke among older patients. And therefore, you know, what we're seeing is not really an unbiased model. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Carly. See now, hopefully that answers your question. Um, if not, feel free to chime in. Great. So this next slide, <clears throat> we're looking at really the effect of long-term um, inequity and discrimination. Um, a lot of what we've talked about have been sort of some short-term predictive problems and how race or sex or age might play a role in how decisions are made or how ML models might generate outcomes, or, I'm sorry, predictions um, that can be sort of utilized at the point of care. Um, but, you know, what, when we really think about it, folks that are in protected classes um, are experiencing this for the entirety of their lives. 
um, for those you know, non-mutable um, characteristics. And there's been some really interesting work called um, around the concept of allostatic load. And this is actually an interesting clinical condition, sorry, clinical um, concept that tries to actually quantify how long-term stress in, can impact the body physically. And I think there's a lot of corollaries here between you know, thinking about um, you know, discrimination and bias and fairness and how that um, can also propagate some of the um, inequity that we see in society um, and also in healthcare. So this figure on the, on the right here actually is a continuum from normal function to actual dysregulation. And really, you know, the job of the, the body is really to kind of keep, we have all these checks and balances in our body that are meant to kind of keep us at a homeostatic um, level, right? We kind of want things to be functioning as a status quo at our own sort of internal baselines. And then many things, whether it be um, a traumatic injury from a car accident or, you know, a cross country move, for example, <laughs> there's many stressful events that can actually kind of throw our body off balance. Um, and, you know, we have stress hormones, we have sort of the noradrenic system um, that kind of can cause our body to exhibit, uh, you know, signs of dysregulation. And that dysregulation over time can actually have significant bearing on our health outcomes. Things like hypertension, heart disease, depression um, are all really kind of reflections of, of our bodies experiencing long-term stress. And so as we think about, you know, the disequity and fairness that might be relevant to a snapshot of a model, um, I think what we're you know, trying to show here is that this is also something that can be propagated and affect these members and protected classes over a number of years. So again, we're coming back here to what we mentioned in an early slide, which is around disparate treatment and disparate impact. And um, that one of the use cases to talk about here is patient no-show no prediction. And this is one we haven't talked about um, yet in this tutorial. So I'll just give kind of a brief background. Um, so, when patients are seen in the outpatient setting for clinical visits, whether that be with a primary care doctor or a specialist of some sort, actually a fair number of patients just don't go to their visit. It's usually around, I think like around 20 to 50%, depending on you know, um, who, that, who that practitioner, what, what specialty of care that might be and sort of the acuity of care required. Um, but really a sizable percentage of outpatient visits are not attended. Um, and so it can be a useful prediction to help sort of offices um, allocate time in their day for visits to actually predict, you know, who might or how often visits might be skipped or missed or patients might not show. Um, but this is really a predictive problem where um, certain, protect, certain patients within protected classes could be, um, could be harmed or could be sort of helped by this, by this so when we think about disparate treatment and disparate impact, again, um, disparate treatment is sort of that, whether it be implicit or explicit bias that the um, human is taking action upon. So with no-show, that could actually be, um, you know, the scheduler could be looking and saying, oh my gosh, you know, this patient is, is 85. I'm just going to go ahead and say they're not going to show up. You know, I don't think they're going to be here on time. Um, you know, they might require getting a driver or any number of factors and it's during you know rush hour i'm not i'm going to go ahead and schedule another patient to come during this time um, disparate impact would actually be something um, around how you know a model who that is predicting folks who are likely to no show might differentially affect people of a protected class um, you know and that may be uh, you know one class of of patients of a certain race um, might have an increased likelihood of not showing just based on what's in the data. And then those sort of prime spots, you know, might be actually allocated to folks who are more likely to show up. So again, we have this tension between um, how do we think about, you know, um, sort of how that model and those outcomes will be acted upon um, by the end users. Mm -hmm. 
So which brings us to a new section, uh, operationalizing fairness in uh, ML healthcare. Uh, so we start with the following observation. Uh, so if you look at uh, if you look at some of the standard assumptions which are baked in uh, the baked in uh, run of the mill um, classification models with respect to uh, the prediction of the risk score. Uh, so the idea is that the predicted risk score has some relationship with some uh, future outcome. Uh, and so that informs uh, what the, uh, what kind of inter intervention that would be, be per would be performed. So an unstated assumption, which is baked in uh, here is that uh, the effect of the treatment is going to be monotonic um, with respect to the risk. Uh, so this may be true for so certain use cases, but that is not always the case. Uh, the number of studies have been done. Um, many of them have come out uh, in the last uh, uh, two years or so, which uh, show to the contrary. Uh, so we are going to focus on one of these uh, from Obermeyer. Uh, so the setting is that, uh, so they actually used uh, data mainly from uh, primary care patients um, over the course of three years in a large academic uh, hospital. And they measured the overall uh, health status of the patients. Uh, so based on the active chronic conditions or also known within the healthcare uh, literature, also known as the core morbidity scores. Um, so basically the number, number of uh, certain conditions that you have, uh, so examples of that would be, let's say if you have heart conditions, you have diabetes, so on and so forth. Um, okay. So that could be a metric which can be used to define how ill you are and uh, that as a quote unquote an objective metric can be used to uh, all other things being equal, used to compare people across groups. Um, and in their audit of their uh, of some of these models, what they observed was that at the same level of algorithmic risk, uh, black people actually have significant more illness burdens than whites. So a that goes on to show, show that the assumption that we the standard assumption uh, that we usually make in these classification models that a that does not hold. Um, um, so A, that's, if, uh, that's basic. Uh, if you look at the graph here, so that would be graph A, uh, where we are observing this. But even beyond this, it has other uh, seemingly non-obvious implications. Uh, okay, so instead of just thinking about the machine learning problem, um, okay, so we're given some data, we process it, uh, we apply some, and we get certain performance and then we apply certain fairness metrics and we are done. Let's think about the process as part of an ecosystem and how the, the insights from the model are actually used. Uh, so these algorithmic scores, they are key input with respect to decision about uh, the future. So let's suppose uh, in this case, um, enrollment in some sort of care coordination uh, program. Uh, so given the observation that less healthy uh, black folks uh, scored at similar risk scores to white folks, uh, so what is going on? So A, uh, that is going to result in substantial uh, disparities. Um, and also, and which in turn is going to lead uh, and going to have an effect with respect to who ends up in these care coordination plans. And uh, in the previous slides, Dr. Carly, talked about the long-term effects of these, uh, of healthcare and these stressors. Um, so it's going to factor into that as well. Um, and the other thing is that um, um, the other is um, baked in assumption um, in retrospect, it'll look obvious, but for uh, if, if you don't really take in the domain knowledge uh, into account, it's really easy to miss, which is that, uh, more often than not, we have models which predict healthcare costs. Uh, 
and healthcare costs are actually not equivalent to healthcare needs. It, it's, it's, it's a very subtle point, but it's extremely important to emphasize this. So in this particular study, what uh, Obermeyer uh, and others observed was that uh, for a given level of health, where the level of health is defined based on the metric of uh, the number of active chronic conditions that a person has, uh, that blacks uh, in general generate lower cost than whites. Uh, so they quantified this to uh, $1,801. Um, all other factors with respect to the chronic conditions being equal. Uh, so that, all right, so that's one dimension. But even beyond that, uh, if we look at the kind of costs which are associated uh, with these two different groups. Um, so we discover that uh, the costs are also different. Um, so A, for example, uh, there are few uh, inpatient surgical and uh, outpatient specialist costs and more costs uh, associated with emergency uh, visits and uh, dialysis. Uh, so there's also, even beyond this one dimension of disparity with respect to race, uh, there's also another the dimension of class which is at, at play. Uh, so from this, what, these, uh, what they conclude is that, um, and this is a direct quote from their paper, that the results suggest that the driving force behind the bias uh, is that black patients generate less medical expenses conditional on health even when we account for uh, specific comorbidities. Uh, and then within that, if you double click, it's because uh, the needs uh, of these different populations are different. And also uh, with respect to uh, patients and different groups getting care early on. So in the long term, uh, generating uh, diff uh, different costs, um, requiring less care versus not getting uh, enough care early on and requiring more care later on. So that, that's another factor which is at play. Sure, so changing gears a little bit here, we're going to talk about the long-term impact of fairness. Um, a few slides back, we did talk about sort of allostatic load and the actual physio physiologic and, um, you know, really the consequences of some long-term um, unfairness and you know, bias can actually have to the, on the human body. Um, this is actually kind of thinking a bit differently. And this is, you know, in complex systems like medicine and healthcare, um, we actually have to consider how the algorithms will affect their environment and the different incentives that are, um, that are affecting the stakeholders over time. Um, and one of the kind of examples here is thinking about risk of readmission. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, um, hospitals, Patients who are discharged from hospitals um, actually are at an increased risk to readmit to that same hospital or to a hospital um, over a certain, you know, over a period of time. And that might be for a number of reasons, whether, you know, their condition might not be um, well managed, you know, they might be sort of uh, post-surgically at higher risk for a complication, et cetera. But effectively, we do see patients kind of coming back to the hospital after they're discharged. Um, and this can be a real problem for hospitals um, because, uh, you know, they are, it's, it's quite expensive to the insurance and to different payers to kind of pay for these repeat hospital visits. Um, so kind of in order to combat this, there's actually been a number of programs put forth that actually um, incentivize uh, healthcare providers and specifically hospitals to really target reducing these readmissions. Um, and that, those incentives are really focused around a certain number of diagnoses and patient types and groups. <laughs> And so it's interesting to think about how those specific incentives um, have changed uh, how care is delivered and how actually providers behave um, when thinking about readmissions. As a consequence, some groups of patients who are not within those targeted groups that are disincentivized from readmitting, um, you know, there might be kind of an opportunity cost here. And a good example of this is um, pediatric patients, right? Um, pediatric patients who are discharged from the hospital are kind of a different type from adult patients, right? They might have, um, it's typically, you know, less common, first of all, right? There's less chronic conditions among that cohort. Um, but because there's such few, you know, really positive cases or positive, um, yeah, cases among that group, a lot of times the, you know, at least in the, the modeling of, of the algorithm, they're sort of, um, you know, the performance might not be very good because they're just not that represented. <clears throat> but because of incentives, we usually really don't 
don't give it as much heed. Um, so kind of longitudinality, right, as we're trying to learn more and, and do more, we need to pay attention to how these incentives are actually directing our work and where we might not be looking because of these, these specific incentives. So another important issue here is um, fairness gerrymandering or intersectionality. So this is looking, you know, we've spent a lot of time now talking about different protected groups, but if you've noticed, we've almost always talked about them in the singular. We've talked about differences by race, differences by sex, differences by age. Um, and where this gets even more complicated is when we think about, you know, when two or more of these actual protected groups come together um, and how we're modeling, modeling this. So we talk a lot about, you know, how do we ensure fairness across age groups? Um, but one thing that's very important is what about um, thinking about gender and age groups or race and age groups and think, making sure that we have adequate representation in our data and also thinking about the fairness um, in the outcomes among these groups as well. <clears throat> Go to the next slide, please. So I really like this quote. This is from um, an article a few years ago, but effectively, you know, this is so common in healthcare. Again, this is not a problem of artificial intelligence or of machine learning. Um, you know, oftentimes we cite studies from randomized control trials in healthcare as being sort of this, um, the ultimate evidence base. And really from a design study perspective, it's true. Um, but if you look at the populations upon which these RCTs were developed, it's usually predominantly white males. Um, there's really some good statistics that I think Anker cited at the beginning around really the, um, you know, the poor diversity across protected features that, that has formed the basis for healthcare literature. And so, um, unfortunately, some of these same um, biases in data have, have, of course, progressed to, to now be um, the training base for our models. <clears throat> Next slide. All right. So based on that observation uh, regarding intersection, intersectionality and gerrymandering with respect to fairness, uh, some researchers have started talking about uh, statistical notions of fairness across exponentially many subgroups. Uh, so think about combinations of these different uh, protected groups that we talked about say, across the, the dimensions of, let's say, race, uh, gender, age, religion, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so the idea is that uh, there should be methods which we could, one could use, the practitioners could use off the shelf and uh, compute these things um, on the fly. Uh, so it turns out that uh, although there are techniques, it is possible to uh, to create techniques which could do that. Uh, but because we are de dealing with these arbitrary defined uh, classes and subclasses, uh, it's computationally challenging. Um, and suppose even if we could uh, partially surmount that challenge, then the question of well, how do we audit such uh, classifiers where we could infinitely uh, dissect these. And even if we could define it, then will we have enough uh, instances um, of these fi finely grain defined uh, instant um, individual subgroups. Um, and, and actually one of the papers uh, from uh, Michael Kearns and his group, uh, they actually show that uh, the, the problem of auditing subgroup fairness, uh, at least for the notions of equality of false positive and statistical parity, is equivalent to the problem of uh, weak agnostic learning, which is another way of saying that it is computationally very hard. Um, uh, so that said, uh, it is they do uh, devise and recommend certain um, heuristics which, which you, one could use, which can be used to solve this problem approximately in, in a large number of contexts and use cases. Uh, so continuing on that, no, on the notion of um, subgroup uh, fairness. Uh, so researchers have uh, also uh, devised uh, a notion of uh, what uh, has been defined as uh, multi-accuracy. Uh, so here the idea is that, uh, is that for a model to be unbiased, um, 
it should be unbiased overall, but also with respect to every identified subpopulation. So suppose you're given a black box classifier and a, a validation set. Um, so the problem is that uh, we have to audit it to determine whether it satisfies uh, the condition of uh, multi-accuracy or not. Um, and it turns out that uh, a solution to that particular problem actually exists. Um, um, in the interest of time, uh, I will skip uh, how multi-accuracy actually works and we can always come back to this if there are questions. Sure. Um, so one of the other sort of ML problems we'll talk about here is um, exploration versus exploitation. Um, and just from a healthcare's perspective, you know, it's interesting. We often, very few times in healthcare, right, can we actually imagine, you know, what might have happened if that patient, um, you know, hadn't had that procedure or hadn't taken that medication or hadn't been prescribed, you know, that course of care. Um, and when we think about, you know, optimizing machine learning and thinking about fairness and bias, we often do want to consider sort of what might have happened um, in that case. Um, when we think about sort of exploration versus exploitation, we do need to consider, um, you know, where the different sort of arms of care um, and how different groups are distributed among those different arms. Um, of course, when we're talking about randomized control trials, right, we always are able to see kind of who that placebo, who's given that placebo versus who's given that um, interventional drug, for example. Um, and there's been, as we talked about in the beginning of this tutorial, you know, many examples, many sort of shameful examples in U.S. history um, around this very problem, around exploiting groups that are, you know, um, underrepresented or um, at, at risk of, um, for bias and um, subjugation, I would say. And of course, the example of the Tuskegee Airmen study is, you know, very in line with this, um, around a number of men who uh, had known syphilis and were not given the correct treatment and were actually not even told about it because um, they actually kind of wanted to see what that course of the disease was. Um, another good example here is actually the underrepresentation of women in clinical trials. Um, and again, hearkening back to that section on intersectionality, um, you know, women of uh, different races are very underrepresented in cl clinical trials. So again, this interplay of, of exploring versus exploiting and, you know, how do we sort of learn more about the clinical course while also making sure that we have a fair and balanced representation of the different classes um, is something that's continuing to, uh, to require um, care. All right, so that brings us to the, to the interesting topic of process fairness versus outcome fairness. Uh, so, all, so literally all of the notions of fairness that we have talked about focus on the, out, on the outcome or the result of, uh, of let's say some prediction, some process. Uh, uh, what process fairness uh, focuses on is that the process which is used uh, in any use case, uh, uh, it's also fair and not just the outcome itself. Uh, uh, and so th this is also a very nascent area of research. Uh, there are just a couple of papers in this. Um, and, and so one way to measure this is that uh, for this particular paper uh, from uh, this group uh, from Max Planck, uh, so they define this as, uh, as as a proxy for measurement is that estimate the degree to which people consider the usage of various fe features to be fair in a model. Uh, the idea being that people have a certain moral sense which guides that decision. So for example, uh, whether somebody considers, let's say race uh, or gender or say zip code of a person to be a criminal history uh, to be fair to be used in a model or not. And it turns out that depend uh, that if, uh, in addition to that, if you tell people regarding um, how the inclusion exclusion of variables is going to affect the outcome, their answer changes. So based on that, they define three different notions of uh, process fairness. So there's feature a priority with respect to, uh, say without having a priority of the uh, outcome, uh, what, what, do, what, what are the different features that people consider? Uh, so these results that I'm going to show are based on their study, uh, empirical study, uh, asking these questions, um, to a large cohort of people. Uh, 
there's also the notion of fairness with respect to uh, if you tell the participants with respect to what the outcome is going to be, that's going to improve the, uh, for example, the accuracy of the classifier. Uh, there's also with respect to whether it will help uh, removed the disparity between the classes. Uh, so uh, based on that, so they performed experiments on uh, synthetic and real data sets. And what they observed was that, um, uh, was that, uh, that depending upon what features you use, um, there you do observe the same, uh, same type of uh, uh, trade-off that we discussed earlier uh, with, uh, with respect to fairness and interpretability and performance in general, um, uh, that uh, if you have this exclusion early on, then your performance degrades. Uh, if you, if not, then uh, because you're dealing with greater number of variables, um, uh, you can your performance will de will degrade. Uh, another related issue is that of a decoupled uh, classifier. Um, so this is more in, more in line or more in terms of how you create uh, classifiers uh, which are more uh, fair. Um, is that so? Assuming that if you have sufficient data uh, for the classes of interest, uh, then uh, if you train a model on the overall population, then because of the population heterog uh, heterogeneous nature of the population, uh, you may end up. Uh, imposing certain trade-offs when you would not want to. So one way to decouple this is that you train classifiers for individual groups using data from that group. Uh, and then there are certain theoretical results with respect to where this will work uh, or not. And uh, a related uh, way to tackle this is uh, is to act to what is uh, uh, what has been referred to as adversarial debiasing. Um, so going back to adversarial ner learning 101. Um, so you uh, so one way to build these models is uh, that uh, you, uh, so given a uh, given a machine learning model, uh, you want to fool that model. Um, and adversarial machine learning focuses on well, how can you prevent that? Uh, so the set, the fair, this particular fairness setting uh, that you're dealing with is that we want to prevent the inference of the target variable, um, uh, given that there's uh, fairness-related conditions associated with that. Uh, and so there are, again, there are a few. Uh, there's a whole bunch of work related to that. Um, and the summary of uh, this work is basically that for different uh, notions of fairness, whether it's demographic parity, equality of odds or opportunity, there are different things uh, which one could infer. Um, and it, it, so that said, uh, given certain conditions, it is possible to come up with a general model agnostic way uh, and somewhat optimal way to d describe these. Uh, conditions. Right, so we now move on to the next section, uh, best practices. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, so we will uh, we will spend uh, just uh, just relatively less time on this. Uh, and again, if there are questions, uh, we will revis we can revisit this uh, towards the end. Sure. So. We do have a number of slides on this. Um, I would say, you know, kind of at a high level, a lot of um, what we're trying to parlay here is the importance of sort of constantly reconsidering the model you're designing, the data that you're going to be using, how that data was collected, you know, what populations was it collected from um, in the training and evaluation of the model. Um, when we think about, you know, that trifecta of um, performance allocation and outcomes. A lot of that is sort of in the deployment and review section. Again, this uh, kind of staging is taken from this Rajkumar paper, um, but really this continuative iterative approach of, you know, thinking about um, fairness, bias, and inequity through, really throughout um, the process. <clears throat> A lot of the best practices here are involving stakeholders early. You know, that means um, data scientists working with clinicians and physicians, 
but also having folks from underrepresented groups or from um, you know patients that might have protected features as well to really think about you know how might we miss how might this be misused um, and not necessarily you know in a um, explicit you know biased way but you know what are the implicit biases that we have what are our blind spots um, and how might we consider proactively addressing those um, you know through all these different steps from model design to deployment and review as we've shown multiple times here that you know we might have perfect grand notions of fairness and eliminating bias and reducing inequity um, among patients but the real world is is a different beast as we're all aware and that you know these centuries of injustice are continuing to kind of permeate permeate society and healthcare is not immune to that um, so we need to consistently be considering implicit and explicit biases um, you know thinking about how these models will be used in the real world and you know what could possibly um, where might harm continue to be propagated um, and looking for opportunities to to help Um, I think I've covered this as well. Um, Mohammed, if you want to either add a bit or I think we can skip a few slides here. All right. Um, yeah, so a few, a few words uh, uh, with respect to uh, best practices and deployment. Uh, so the, many of these are taken from uh, an excellent primer by uh, Kramer and others uh, from 2019. Uh, so, it, for and within the context of uh, healthcare and also e even beyond that, uh, so ensuring unbiased, uh, unbiased or at least less biased models with this, uh, fairness. Uh, so, just focusing on the on the data and models, so that's not sufficient. Uh, there are external factors, uh, uh, things like uh, model drift, uh, data drift can happen over time. Um, so, there's always this need to uh, continuously monitor what you have. So, match between training data, test data, uh, you're looking at the distributions, uh, how the system is being used, and and also bringing these you know, the stakeholders with respect to people, not just people who are going to use the system, but also people who will be affected, uh, to getting them continuously uh, back to the table and auditing these systems to ensure that the system that was fair continues to be fair. So it's not, the so fairness is not an end product, but it's better to think about this as a process, uh, something that is uh, continuous. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, so that requires putting auditing systems in uh, place uh, for these. Uh, and then uh, as is the case with all machine learning systems, um, so there's also likely to be uh, feedback loops. Uh, uh, so based on the prediction of the output that you can get from a machine learning model, you, um, you take some actions that uh, creates a change in the world. And then based on that change, uh, uh, your model changes and it may or may not be fair afterwards. So we've kind of cataloged here a lot of the challenges and open questions in this space. As you can see, there's um, a lot of interesting topics, a lot of sort of areas for, for the research and for work um, specifically to healthcare. So um, a few of these have been brought up in the chat and questions that we um, discussed. So I just encourage you know you all when you have a few minutes to perhaps to come back to these slides and and think about these. Um, but I think a lot of the answers are that you know we need to keep asking these questions quite frankly and that um, in different areas of healthcare and in different contexts with different patient populations that you know there might not be a one-size-fits-all answer but that we need to keep kind of um, thinking about them and thinking about how we can really um, continue to promote equity and fairness um, among our patients. All right, so that concludes our section. Uh, so at this point, I will uh, hand over the control to our colleague, uh, Christine. Hi, everyone, I'm muted.
Um, today I'll share with you a preview of our forthcoming release uh, through what we intend to be one of several tutorials. Uh, Kensai is developing a new library. Well, I don't, Mohammed, could you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, a new library designed to address fairness specifically for healthcare applications. Uh, this will be a tool that we use to facilitate our own healthcare applications, which uh, we are releasing so that others can gain from our experience. Um, it will include tools for measuring and mitigating fairness related bias. Um, examples include comparison of classifiers in terms of the uh, fairness performance trade off and uh, arbitrary comparison of protected versus intersectional classes. Uh, our alpha release will be coming out in the next couple of days with the Jupyter Notebook tutorial that I'm about to show you as the, the main component of that release. Um, through that tutorial, I'll introduce you to some common methods for measurement and comparison of uh, fairness, fairness metrics uh, using publicly available data. Uh, Mohammed, next slide, please. Great. Uh, this work is a joint collaboration of the Kensai Innovation Team. This release uh, specifically includes a tutorial that uses data from the MIMIC3 clinical database, which is a freely available source of electronic health records. Uh, specifically, it contains records for the critical care wards at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston from uh, 2001 to 2012. Um, and although it is freely available, you'll need to complete a 30 to 60 minute human subject certification to gain approval. Um, and that approval process can take a few days. So bear that in mind if you're interested in uh, loading and testing this data at home and uh, messing with this notebook on your own. Um, at present, our, our work uh, focuses on scikit-learn compatible me uh, measures. And these examples will all use the XGBoost library through the XGBoost classifier. Um, so now I'll share with you our, great, uh, so this is the tutorial itself. Um, if you'll focus your attention at the tutorial contents list near the top of the screen, um, you can, or I guess in the middle of the screen, um, you can follow along with the overview that I'm about to give you. Um, I'll begin this walkthrough with a quick recap of the fairness metrics you've seen earlier in the talk. I'll then walk you through the setup for our baseline model and our first test model. Uh, once we have our models set up, I'll step you through the different measurements that are available in a library called AIF360, uh, which is a fairly comprehensive Python package for fairness measurement and uh, related mitigating algorithms. Um, as I said, I'll use AIF360 to walk you through about uh, 10 different measures of fairness depending on time. Um, and I'll relate those methods back to the metrics you learned earlier in this talk that Mohammed introduced. Um, I'll give you examples for how to evaluate them, how to compare them against each other, and how to compare them between models. Finally, I'll show you examples from another useful Python library called FairLearn, and you'll see that the two libraries are fairly similar in terms of their APIs. So we, as we mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we define a fair model as one that imposes no discrimination, no unjustified treatment of individuals in socially salient groups. Uh, we refer to those as protected attributes in terms of these models. Uh, sometimes they're also known as sensitive attributes or protected features, sensitive features. Um, but how is it that we quantify that fairness? Uh, as Dr. Carly mentioned, there are two uh, major concepts of disparity in, in uh, this uh, fairness paradigm. Those are disparate treatment and disparate impact, where disparate treatment is um, uh, direct action that, that clearly treats different, uh, different, um, different groups differently, and disparate impact is the application of ostensibly unbiased practices or procedures that actually result in unfair differential treatment. Uh, as you've already seen, there are, uh, what, what we'll be measuring these models is disparate impact. Um, so there, as Mohammed mentioned, there are six uh, common metrics for fairness, which are all listed in this fairness metrics quick reference. Uh, 
uh, which will be available to you when um, this alpha release uh, comes out in a couple of days. Um, those six metrics are uh, unawareness, which regards simply whether a protected attribute has been used in the data. Next, there's uh, demographic parity, which validates whether the outcomes are the same. The positive prediction rates should be approximately the same across groups. Next is equalized odds, which similarly validates consistent conditional prediction probabilities um, that is conditioned upon membership in each group. Um, last is uh, in terms of the, the group measures, uh, the group metrics is uh, predictive parity, which validates positive and negative predictive parity between classes of the protected attribute. Uh, the above, as I mentioned, are considered group measures of fairness, and alternatively, there are individual measures of fairness that evaluate whether like individuals are treated the same. We'll, um, for individual fairness, we'll look at something called a consistency score, as, as well as a few other metrics um, related to uh, generalized entropy. Lastly, there's uh, counterfactual fairness, which involves proving that a counterfactual example derives the same results as the original model. Um, we won't cover counterfactual fairness in this walkthrough since it's a bit more complicated to implement and more importantly because it's not available in the libraries that we've uh, included in the tutorial. We also will not cover uh, implementation level measurements of fairness and by that I mean measuring the effect of an applied machine learning model over time. Uh, Google has a great library for that um, and there's a, a link to that in the tutorial. Um, in fact, there are references for both of those techniques, counterfactual fairness and um, implementation level measurements uh, in the tutorial. So first we'll load our mimic data. Uh, this tutorial comes with a helper function that will automatically read, clean, and format the raw zip files that you'll receive when you download your mimic data. Um, the important things for you to know are that we've added um, an age variable that we put in five-year bins uh, concordant with uh, public health uh, categories. Uh, we dropped data for patients greater than 65 years of age. Uh, additionally, we recategorized gender, uh, the gender attribute as a binary feature where one indicates male, and zero of course be female. Uh, we also calculate a length of stay variable about which I'll discuss more in a moment. Um, and lastly, we've one hot encoded the majority of our features, um, as you can see here at the bottom of the screen. Again, we've tried to keep things uh, relatively simple. For these examples, we've included only demographic and insurance information uh, in addition to the patient's diagnosis and treatment codes. Uh, encoded in single level CCS categories. Um, you can see in the table at the top of the screen the, the list of original features. Uh, so in addition to the age variable we added, we've included diagnosis, ethnicity, gender, insurance, language, marital status, procedure, and religion. Um, our actual models will be more simple than that. Uh, at the bottom is an example of what they look like when they're one hot encoded, as I mentioned, and you'll notice that we renamed the gender attribute to gender M to be more explicit. Uh, moving on, uh, we'll start with a baseline length of stay model. Uh, to be specific, uh, by length of stay, I mean the amount of time spent in an intensive care ward for a given admission at the Best Israel Deaconess Hospital. As you can see highlighted in the aquamarine, aquamarine cells, uh, the, the mean length of stay for the data set uh, as we formatted is about nine days. Uh, we've also added a binary feature, which will be the target for our models called long LOS, uh, indicating that a given length of stay is either above or below the mean. Uh, in this case, the mean value for long LOS is about 0 0.39, meaning that about 39% of the observations in the data set uh, have a length of stay above the mean. So again, this model is meant to be simple. So we use only age, diagnosis, and procedure features for our baseline prediction. Uh, we then apply an extra-use classifier, uh, which you can see yields moderate results 
decent precision and accurate accuracy with weak recall for the positive class, but better recall for the negative class. Um, so let's say for this example that we have some evidence to suggest that gender will be predictive for the negative class, uh, which is highlighted in that maroon color. Um, and for whatever reason, the negative class is what we're optimizing for. So that gender is considered a protected attribute. So you want to ensure that there's no disparate impact by including it as a feature. Uh, first, I will look at the mean values, again, highlighted in that aquamarine green. And we observe that they're fairly similar between the privileged and unprivileged group. Again, where males are assumed to be privileged uh, and they're uh, categorized as one, and females are assumed to be unprivileged. We then generate our gender inclusive model. And as you can see, we get similar results as to our baseline. Uh, although our recall has gone up slightly for the negative class, which is, again, the class we're optimizing for. Uh, so in our example, then, we'd like to keep these results. But uh, should we keep this feature in our model? Um, before I move on, are there any questions about the material you've seen so far? Okay, great. Um, so to measure disparate impact in this model, we'll first use uh, AIF360. Uh, AIF360 is a fairly comprehensive library, as I said, with a straightforward API. Uh, it comes with clear documentation that has good examples and the code is relatively easy to parse. Um, we'll be focusing on measures available in this package as they exist in the scikit compatible extension, um, but there are comparable measures in, um, in their other API, in their uh, main API. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the library comes with some potentially useful statistical functions, uh, the base rate and the selection rate mainly. The base rate is just the average value of the ground truth, and the selection rate is the average value of the predictions. Uh, for a binary model such as this, that equates to the probability of a positive class, in this case, a, a long length of stay for either the ground truth or the predictions. Uh, as a small formatting note before move, we move on, uh, AIF360 expects the protected attribute to be set as uh, the index of the um, array inputs you're about to see. So here at the top of the screen, you'll see one example of how you might do that. But uh, moving forward, we have a helper function that will take care of all of that for us. All right, so starting with the group measures. We'll first look at measures of demographic parity. Uh, as we saw before, demographic parity is where selection rates are approximately the same for all protected groups. We can measure this either with the, with the difference or with the ratio between the rates of the two groups. Um, for example, the statistical parity difference, um, sometimes known as the demographic parity difference, um, is the difference in the probability of prediction between the two groups. Um, a difference of zero indicates that the model is perfectly fair relative to the protected attribute. So it, it favors neither the privileged nor the unprivileged group. Uh, and values between about negative 0.1 and 0.1 are considered reasonably fair. Alternatively, the disparate impact ratio is the ratio between the probability of positive prediction for the unprivileged group and the probability of positive prediction for the privileged group. Uh, so a ratio of one here indicates that the model is fair relative to the protected attribute and values between 0.8 and 1.2 are considered reasonably fair. So we can see here uh, at the bottom of the screen underneath that uh, uh, maroon text um, that According to these measures, um, this model is pretty close to fair relative to the gender attribute. Um, and notably, this is only one test, so we would, would want to test on other subsamples as well. So next are measures of equal odds. 
Uh, as a reminder, e uh, for equal odds to be true, the prob probability of positive prediction must be approximately the same for all groups. Uh, the average odds difference uh, is the average of the difference in false positive rate and true positive rate between the two predicted groups. Uh, next, the average odds error is the average of the absolute difference in false positive rate and true positive rate between the protected groups. And the equal opportunity difference is the difference in true positive rate. So it's the difference in the recall scores between the different groups. And for all three of these measures, uh, values between negative 0.1 and 0.1 are considered reasonably fair. Uh, so by plugging in our examples, we can see that all of these values are well under 0.1 which indicates that this model is fair relative to the gender attribute by these measures. Uh, and I have those values there at the bottom of the screen. AIF 360 also comes with some useful uh, difference and ratio methods, which we use to demonstrate predictive parity here and um, differences between a couple of other uh, pr performance scores. Um, the positive predictive parity difference, for example, is the difference in positive predictive values. Uh, we can pass almost any function to these methods to obtain bi-group fairness scores. Uh, we can even pass scikit-learn functions to it. So as you can see here, I calculated between group AUC difference between group balance accuracy difference. Um, you can see those underneath the maroon text at the bottom of the screen. Um, again, in this case, the model is supposedly fair by this measure, measure relative to gender. The differences are close to zero and the ratios are close to one. So lastly, we'll look at measures of individual fairness. Uh, one example is the consistency score, as I mentioned before. Uh, consistency scores measure the similarity between specific pred predictions and the predictions of like individuals. Um, in this case, likeness is defined using the nearest neighbors algorithm, uh, using the five nearest neighbors, um, and using the ball tree algorithm on the back end. Um, their consistency score is the, the complement of the mean distance to the mean nearest neighbor. So a zero value will indicate fairness and increasing values indicate increasing unfairness. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. A, a one value will indicate um, consistency and decreasing values indicate decreasing consistency. My apologies. Um, it's worth noting that um, Many measures of individual fairness, and specifically those that are included in AIF 360, are dimensionless, which means that they can only be used to measure relative fairness. Um, the generalized entropy measures that we'll talk about in a moment are uh, one example of that. They include a special case. Um, however, they do include a special case that can be converted into another measure, which I'll talk about in a moment. So focusing back on the consistency score, um, yeah, we can see here that our, our score is about 0.83, which means the, uh, which is fairly close to one, so, so fairly close to consistent. Um, but it's, it's really more helpful to evaluate this in the context of another model. Okay. So our final measures um, are related to a concept called the generalized entropy index. It was first proposed as a metric for income inequality in the early 1980s, but it originates as a measure of redundancy in information theory. Um, as you can see, there's an alpha parameter that modulates the formula. Um, and from that, we'll consider two notable special case, cases, uh, which are included in the IF360. The first is the, the Thiel index, um, which occurs when alpha equals one. It's notable simply because it can be converted to something called the Atkins index, which is on a um, which is dimensional on the dimension of zero to one. Um, and the other special case is the coefficient of variation, which is proportionate to the generalized entropy index where alpha equals two. I'm going to um, skip over the rest of the generalized entropy index related measures for, in the interest of time, um, but there's more information about them in the notebook 
so putting this all together, um, let's compare these measures as a group and then compare them to our baseline. Um, as I mentioned, this tutorial function or this tutorial includes a helper function uh, that returns a data frame containing results uh, for all of the measures we just discussed or, or the highlights of the measures that we just discussed. Um, so here we um, load a data frame of the results for the gender inclusive model and then another for the baseline model without gender and merge them together to create this table at your bottom at the bottom of your screen. Uh, in the far left, you'll see the name of the measure in question. In the middle are the values for the attributes inclusive model, the one that included gender as a feature. Um, and similarly, in the right hand column are the measures for our baseline model, which exclude that feature. Um, and remember, these are measure values relative to the gender attribute. So you can see that the measures for these models are very close. Um, let's first look at the group measures, which are emphasized in blue. Uh, the difference between the two, or the differences between um, the two models are quite small. Um, by some measures, the, the gender included model is slightly more fair. By other measures, the baseline is slightly more fair. And again, I mean relative to the gender attribute. Uh, we discussed earlier that the range of fairness for the difference measures we looked at is between negative 0.1 to 0 0.1. And the uh, disparate impact ratio uh, uh, is on the range from 0 0.8 to 1.2 in, in terms of what it, what constitutes a fair score. Uh, so we can see that the majority of these measures um, indicate that the model is fair relative to the gender attribute. Again, we can't draw conclusions yet from this. It's only one test um, and additional investigation is needed. Um, but where do those numbers come from? Uh, well, in the, the late 1970s, during a time when the US government first started measuring and asserting fair treatment in the workplace, uh, the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission adopted what they call the four-fifths rule. Essentially, it's not a rule, uh, but a guideline saying that the selection rate for any given group can't be any less than four-fifths of the best rate. So all groups should be within at least 20% of the best rate. Um, that rule since propagated to become the standard in uh, machine learning as well. So if we apply this four-fifths rule to the disparate impact ratio, for example, which we see highlighted in green, it indicates that both models are, are within fairness tolerance. And in fact, our gender inclusive model is slightly more fair by this measure, although the degree is probably insignificant. And again, it, there may be some element of randomness in there. Um, looking now at individual fairness, we can see that the consistency score for the gender inclusive model prediction is slightly higher than that of the baseline model. Um, and that's uh, toward the bottom of the table in green. Uh, this may indicate that the gender inclusive model is able to discern uh, gender associated medical nuance, uh, re referencing back to Sina's question that Dr. Carly answered. Um, so uh, it, it may indicate that there's uh, differing efficacy in gender associated treatments, for example. Um, hence, we can hypothesize that this gender inclusive model is actually more consistent um, although additional work will be needed to understand this pattern to determine whether that's actually true. Uh, and before we move on, uh, let's think back to the unawareness metric. Uh, notice how in this example, our unaware model is not necessarily more fair than the model including the protected attribute by many of these measures. So let's look at one more example. Here we'll make another model uh, like our gender inclusive model, but this time we'll include instead a Boolean column indicating whether a patient speaks English at the time of their admission. Uh, you can see again in the aquamarine highlights near the top of your screen um, that uh, mean lengths of stay are quite similar, although this time there's a slightly wider gap. Uh, we can see, however, from the t-test near the bottom of the screen, um, also highlighted in green, uh, that the difference in these means is not statistically significant. So again, we'll train our model and send it through our, our helper functions and get our measures to create our comparison table. 
And again, many of the measures for this model are fair relative to the language attribute. Um, however, interestingly, the, the disparate impact ratio for the language inclusive model is quite high. It's above the aforementioned threshold of 1.2 and thus is evidence of potential disparate impact. Um, the same measure, as we can see for the baseline model, is significantly lower, uh, such that we can consider it fair relative to the language attribute, um, at least according to these group measures. So since the other measures are fairly similar, we'll want to do some investigation to determine where this effect is coming from. Uh, it could be an effect of randomness, it could be the sample that we chose, um, or it could be something inherent in the, in the data. Um, it's also worth noting that these scores, uh, oh, I just mentioned that, sorry. Um, so finally in this walkthrough, um, I'll compare AIF360 to another, uh, another really useful uh, library called FairLearn. Um, so as you, as you can see in the table there, they contain many similar measures. Um, however, the FairLine measures are sometimes defined such that their values are irrespective of uh, which rate belongs to the privileged group, uh, which I'll get more into in a moment. Um, it also does not include measures of individual fairness. So to, just to quickly highlight the differences uh, in the definitions of demographic parity, you can see here they, um, they define uh, the difference in the ratio according to whichever, um, whichever rate is higher between the two, um, between two groups or between all of the potential groups in the protected attribute. Um, so that frees them from deciding which attribute is the privileged group. It also includes uh, additional measures of equal odds, um, the equalized odds difference, and the equalized odds ratio, uh, which compare the true positive rates um, and false positive rates, um, comparing the differences or the ratios, and just testing if, if anything is above zero, essentially. Um, it also has some group summary functions and difference functions that are similar to what we saw in AIF360 above. Great, so um, as you've seen, measuring fairness with AIF 316 for LRN is relatively straightforward. Uh, we discussed the four-fifths rule for evaluating significance of fairness measures and demonstrated the value of comparing multiple measures against each other, uh, both for a single model and across multiple models. Um, through the tutorial, you considered reasonable justification for the inclusion of protected attributes within a machine learning model and finally saw the similarity between the APIs for AIF 360 and FairLearn. Uh, using our new understanding of these metrics, we can now apply different techniques, such as a specialized algorithm to mitigate the unfairness that we find in our models. Um, many algorithms are available in AIF 360 and FairLearn, as you can see in the table at the bottom of the screen. Um, and they'll be available to you in the tutorial, so you can just look them up there. Um, and forthcoming installments of our FairML Health Library will include examples and uh, facilitate that work to enhance your workflow as applies to healthcare related models. So that includes our walk, uh, concludes our walkthrough for the first tutorial of our FairML Health Package. Uh, thank you for your time. Are there any questions? So Sina asks, uh, which metrics take into consideration the proxy features as well? Uh, well, it will depend on how you define it um, how, and how you define the data being fed into the model. Um, for simplicity, we uh, used only one, one attribute here and we compared, um, we compared metrics against that same attribute, but you could, um, you know, use proxy measures in your model and then use a different attribute in your comparison. Uh, so let's say I wanted to look at um, language as a proxy for race. I could generate a model that included language and then separately uh, run race through these metrics and um, and get measures for, or sorry, run race through these um, functions and get measures for race. 
relative to a model that includes proxies. So that would be one way to handle it. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Christine. Uh, uh, so we can actually take that and also generalize this. Uh, so majority of uh, the majority of the notions uh, of uh, fairness that we dealt with today, especially the six canonical ones. So if we talk about uh, our bit taking into account arbitrary features, uh, which a model or a notion of fairness can take into account, um, then there then these canonical notions, uh, they don't have a straightforward way to capture this. Uh, that said, uh, in addition to these six canonical notions, there are other notions of fairness which have been defined. Uh, so there's one notion uh, known as uh, EL fairness or explicit latent uh, fairness. Uh, so there's not a, they're not included in any of these packages or to the best of my knowledge, there's publicly available code is not available, uh, but in a 2018 paper, uh, this was defined by a group uh, from Yale, where uh, where the idea is that we can uh, the way to measure uh, fairness is not with respect just with respect to protected classes, but even beyond that, if there are uh, correlations or similarity between uh, instances, uh, then they would be treated as if um, they are are part of some protected groups. So that particular notion of fairness can uh, capture arbitrary, arbitrary uh, similarities and uh, create fair algorithm, uh, fair models with respect to that. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Christine. Can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, so as you can tell, this is a fantastic effort. I hope all of you um, got a good chance to look at the broad field of fairness and bias-free machine learning in healthcare, all under one roof. But to make it, uh, make it real, we also decided to have this implementation back release of this library today, so everyone can contribute and share in it. Uh, so hoping that the uh, entire community can take advantage of the amazing work that the team has done here to put not just all the content together, but also to uh, provide us with uh, with the framework that we can all take from GitHub and take it forward. Uh, folks, today we covered a lot. We began our tutorial uh, just about four hours ago. Uh, after uh, after you know talking about the foundations of fairness in healthcare. We developed a working definition for the framework and how to measure uh, framework, uh, the fairness across many, many different dimensions in healthcare. We then discussed the operational issues with implementations and examples of the pros and cons of each approach. And this also helped us to see that fairness techniques across the pipeline of operationalizing machine learning in healthcare is not trivial. But honestly, much remains to be done in this field. Uh, here are the few things that we can do together. The next slide, please, Mohan. So one of the things we can do is curate better data sets. Uh, so deployment of enterprise grade AI and ML uh, at multiple locations, US and internationally is non-trivial. But fairness across locations, settings, and cohorts is important. So uh, access to these data sets and ensuring that at least data bias is removed is very important. 
Uh, I think Mohammed, you haven't refreshed the slides. So would you mind just refreshing it? It's okay. It's okay. We can keep going. No worries. Uh, so second is please partner with us. Uh, it takes a village to really bring it all together. And as I mentioned earlier, the the more inputs and views we have from all of you uh, on this tutorial will help us formulate the, the problem and the setting for such an important problem uh, and look forward to more collaborations from, from each one of you. Next slide, please. So we are not alone. Uh, there has been a significant amount of background work that has been done. Many organizations and nonprofits have focused on fairness, but none of them have exclusively focused on healthcare machine learning driven fairness. So there are uh, some notable organizations like Partnerships on AI uh, that have raised the visibility level of the issues in ethical AI and responsible AI, uh, even up to the uh, White House and the US government. Uh, there's the International Collaborative Group, uh, the Algorithmic Justice League, uh, the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. So uh, these are some resources for you guys to all look up and see uh, what what we can do together and join any of these partnerships or be part of it, uh, at least follow them and you'll get a much more deeper understanding of both, not just societal, but also some of the philosophical and legal issues behind uh, fairness and, and, and bias in, in healthcare, or at least in general, and then the work that we have been doing on healthcare. Next slide, please. These are some of the libraries uh, and I think Christine walked us through AIF and Fair Learn to a certain extent. Uh, and now, now that we have tried to bring a, you know, some of these under one roof with the Fair ML in health library, uh, hopefully it will be much easier to implement on top of scikit-learn and uh, we'll, we'll you know, uh, go from there. Uh, is is anything missing here? So one of the questions we have for the audience is if you know of any libraries or work that has been done in this space, but we haven't captured it or we have missed it, uh, we would all appreciate if you could point us to that and make the tutorial and the slides uh, much better. Uh, so that we can then broadly distribute it across the community and everyone can um, you know draw from it uh, and it becomes a comprehensive resource so please do share that with us um, that's uh, mostly what we have next few slides are references which Mohammed probably we should flash uh, for the sake of completeness so all the references that were cited in this presentation and tutorial today uh, are, are provided here. But again, if we are missing any important work uh, and you know it is pure oversight and not intentional, so we apologize in advance for uh, missing some work that you may have done or you know of, but please point it to us and we are more than open to include it in the subsequent versions of this uh, tutorial. So with that, I want to thank everyone and see if there are any questions or comments that we should take. And I'll pause here. Great, if not, thank you so much. Uh, everyone for attending. We look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time at Health Day at KDD with the focus on AI for COVID. Uh, 
come ready for an amazing session tomorrow uh, with panels and some great research, research presentations on uh, how COVID is being handled by the community. So with that, I want to once again thank uh, Muhammad, Carly, Christine, Juva, Vikas, and Arpit for collaborating with me on this tutorial. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending and hope it was, uh, it met your standards. Take care. Good evening.